Hello everyone and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today I am delighted to welcome back Dr. Louis Fatui, an author and researcher in Islamic studies and comparative religion. You're most welcome, sir. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. It's always uh, delightful to be back on your brilliant channel. Good, good to see you. Dr. Fatui was born in Baghdad, Iraq, and migrated to the UK in the 90s. He has a PhD in astronomy from Durham University, one of the great universities of England, actually. He came originally from a Christian family, but reverted to Islam in his early 20s. He's published over 25 books in English and Arabic in Islamic studies and published over 20 research papers in cosmology and applied historical astronomy and on the Islamic calendar. Today, Dr. Uh, Fatui has kindly agreed to discuss the fascinating and not uncontroversial topic of the miracles of the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace. And before um, we go over to uh, Dr. Fatui, I just want to quote uh, from a magazine called First Things. It's a very distinguished, um, almost academic uh, American journal, uh, uh, Christian slash Catholic uh, evangelical. And a Christian writer has, uh, in an article, has made the, the interesting claim. And he, he writes that the verse in the Quran, quote, if only miracles could come down from his Lord, that's a quote of the disbelievers, 2950, seems to establish that, in Quranic terms, metaphysical miracles are not given to the prophet Muhammad, or the Muslim prophet, he says, I should say. Uh, the writer continues, the Quran actually indicates one of the reasons why Allah refrained from supporting Muhammad with miracles. And he quotes the Quran here. What stopped us, Allah, from sending the miracles is that the previous generations have rejected them. That's Quran 1759. And the writer continues. Thus, the Quran, he says, clearly and explicitly denies any association of Muhammad with heavenly supernatural miracles, signs, and wonders. If other later religious texts, nonetheless, seem to suggest that Muhammad did perform miracles, they stand in direct opposition to these verses, among many others, in Islam's scripture. End quote. Uh, now, the Christian writer who wrote these words is uh, a guy called Ayman S. Ibrahim, who is assistant professor of Islamic studies and senior fellow for the Christian understanding of Islam at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, which I happen to know is in Kentucky in the United States. It's in the, the buckle of the Bible Belt. It's a very conservative evangelical seminary, huge, very well endowed, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of money. Um, now, I, I quote this because it is a very common trope amongst Christian polemicists. If you look online, social media, Speaker's Corner, you'll often get Christians, missionaries, pushing back against the idea of the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom BP is doing any miracles, saying, look, your, your scriptures deny this, refute this um, uh, idea. So it's, it's an important point, I think, to, to discuss. And I know Dr. Louis Fatou will uh, address this and other, other issues in his presentation just wanted to share with you a very common objection to the whole notion of of miracles um so thank you and over to you sir thank you paul thank you very much bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim allahumma salli ala sayyidina muhammad al-wasfu al-wahf al-risalati wal-hikma wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima assalamu alaykum um assalam obviously this is um, as you said a rather controversial subject Hmm. Um, my approach to this subject isn't going to be any different from how, how I approach other topics in Islamic studies. We can't ignore the world around us. When we communicate, when we write, we, I, I'm not one of those who would like to write to his little own community, as hmm. big or small it is. We are live in the world. Um, the Prophet Sallallahu lived on his own, started a whole religion, a whole message in a world that was completely different to him. Communication and communicating, communicating with others is at the heart of his message. So we can't ignore those. And I mentioned last time, uh, Paul, we spoke about the concept of pride. In it. And uh, I did say that personally, uh, I always notice that I learn more from people that I disagree with mm. than those I agree with because they yeah. 
mm. present me with challenges, some of them I haven't thought of. Yeah. And they force me to go and reassess what mm. I have, what I believe in, etc. So that's definitely very kind of suitable way really to set the scene. Mm. Uh, and I'm definitely not going um, to rehash uh, just what's been out there. And this isn't either a listing of all the um, narratives that talk about miracles of the Prophet ﷺ, alleged or true ones. But it's not just because that's not going to be of much value, really. So for those who would like to have a more kind of listing, if you like, of everything, any claim and every claim that has been made, there's, there are plenty of books articles but really the internet is, as well is full of this information so that's not what i'm doing here i'm not just sitting here to say oh there are these hundreds of miracles let's list them one after another that's not going to be adding any value i should also clarify what i'm going to talk about this isn't i'm not going to i'm not going i'm not setting out to prove miracles now, what we're going to talk is, is miracles, and there, there is some implication, of course, if we can show that people at the time of the Prophet ﷺ witnessed miracles, what they considered, then, of course, this is a claim um, that or, or evidence that miracles exist. But that's not specifically what I'm tackling. It's a slightly different subject, uh, that one, but very obviously related to what we're talking about. And obviously there are people who don't believe in the supernatural to start with mm -hmm. uh, religious or otherwise that's not i'm not addressing those and this claim in this i think what um, my kind of one second reply to that to these people is that they need to get out more <laughs> um, i think um, mm. the world is far more diverse and rich with information they actually think yes yes uh, so so that that that's not so what is it then um i'm going to talk about uh the main question we're gonna deal with here did the prophet وسلم, experience perform any miracles that's mm -hmm. really the main question the answer will be yes so that's just to so that people know the conclusion and then we're gonna see we'll go through the road map how to get to there also, I'm going to deal, as we obviously, these are all kind of records, historical records that we have. So we have to deal with those sources. So what does the Quran say? Uh, what do Hadith books say? Other sources? How do they relate to each other? Mm -hmm. um, where do we take the majority of our information? Which one is more reliable, etc.? These kind of the questions that come up all the time. Uh, maybe some of them are more settled for Muslims, but may not be the same for non-Muslims. So we're going to deal with those as well. Okay. And I should also add um, to Muslim brothers and sisters who may not be aware, there are actually Muslims, tiny minority, who deny that the Prophet وسلم, performed miracles. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying these are Muslims, lay Muslims. Some of them are learned Muslims, people who have studied, scholars, they have their own thinking, tiny, tiny minority. But mm. then you can argue and say there is no view on the planet Earth that doesn't have some people who believe in it. So that's not, you know, a kind of a, a, a proof or indication or anything. But we have to acknowledge that this exists also, this claim uh, within Muslims. If I were to kind of present the belief in the miracles of the Prophet Sallallahu or disbelief as a spectrum. So if you think about it, you have two ends there. On one extreme, you've got people who believe everything they read about the Prophet Muhammad and his miracles, what, whatever is reported. At the other end of the spectrum, there are people uh, who just don't believe anything, none of that. Mm -hmm. Not the Quran, no nothing else. Now, these are two extreme kind of ends and I don't mean by extreme any kind of derogatory description I'm just describing that these kind of the opposite ends of the spectrum yes most now if you if you think of this end the, for me the left right end that's where people don't believe in anything that's usually mm -hmm. non-muslims who don't believe in the prophet if you bring it further down 
towards this end, uh, then you will have those Muslims I mentioned earlier who believe in the Quran as a miracle and they consider it a miracle of the Prophet Sallallahu but not others. Mm -hmm. The majority of Muslims fall between this end and the other extreme. Mm. So most of us, including myself, believe that the Prophet Sallallahu performed miracles. That does not necessarily mean every record, every narrative, every story is correct. Mm. And that's not a statement on the, on, the, on the kind of reports of miracles. That's a statement on historical records, on historical reports. Yeah. That's just natural kind of view. So, now we're going to start with, I've got a slideshow. <clears throat> Here we go. I put it up. Thank you, Paul. And um, the, I'm going to start by talking, not really, because it's not, you know, I'll explain this as we go along. The miracle is not the main subject we're talking about here. But of course, the Quran is a miracle itself, mm. and it contains miracles. And because of that, and also all Muslims agree, it's the biggest, greatest miracles of the Prophet Sallallahu Because of that, we cannot not really um, talk about it. So... It's got the headline there, the inimitable Quran. Yeah, I'm just trying to see, hold on, sorry. Uh, right. There we go. So what, what does sorry, Doctor uh, Fui, can we can you just define the word inimitable uh, for us, please? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm coming to that. So okay. the Quran. Uh, why is it miraculous? It's miraculous because it is. It's a book that can the like of which cannot be created, cannot mm. be produced. That is a claim that exists in the Quran itself. That's the source yeah. of the claim. And this is one verse that says that now the Quran has said um, in, in kind of several uh, places uh, that the Quran as a whole cannot be replicated, cannot be reproduced by anyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, um, any 10 chapters of it cannot be, nobody can create even 10 chapters. And then uh, in two places it says not even a single chapter. Yes. So the inimitability uh, of the Quran is a Quranic claim itself. Yeah, it can't be imitated. So inevitable, the, the word is Im imitated. It can't be imitated. It can't be copied, reproduced. Uh, so it's inimitable. It's, it's impossible, the claim is, to copy or reproduce the Quran uh, in that way. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Paul, I would appreciate at times some, you know, clarification and your interjections. I might at times skip something or not say it very clearly. So I'd really appreciate that, Paul. Sure. So now this is one ayah uh, addressing the Prophet Sallallahu Say, then bring a scripture from Allah which is more guiding than either of them that I may uh, follow it. If you're truthful. If you're truthful um, is um, a kind of a phrase that's repeated regularly mm. in challenges like these. So here it's talking about a scripture, a scripture. So challenging um, uh, the the disbelievers uh, to bring uh, another scripture, similar scripture. This is another verse, or do they say he has made it up? So they obviously accuse the Prophet Sallallahu of uh, authoring the Quran. Rather, they do not believe. What is What does that mean? So they, they actually, the what, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here is that the the source and the real drive uh, of the argument isn't that they have studied it carefully, looked at it, and then concluded this is something that Muhammad sallallahu wa produced. No, this is really just a prejudice they had against the Quran. Then it goes on to tell those disbelievers, then let them produce a speech like it if they are truthful and again it's a challenge uh, for the um, disbelievers to create something similar this challenge 
is ongoing. It's an internal and attainable challenge. And that's how it's described in the Quran. Again, it's addressing the Prophet If mankind and the jinn gathered in order to produce the lack of this Quran, they could not produce the like of it, even if they backed one another. This is about producing the like of it. Now, look at that. Another, uh, and if you are in doubt about what we have sent down upon our servant, then produce a chapter like it and call upon your witnesses other than Allah, if you are truthful. But the ending is very firm and very certain. But mm. if you do not do, and you will never do, mm. do not do, and uh, you will never do. So what you have here is uh, two things. First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the Quran, anything similar to the Quran cannot be created. Uh, the second is to address the disbelievers directly and to say, go and just gather as many allies, uh, helpers, etc. Ins or jinn, people or jinn, to try and create anything like the Quran, you will not be able to do that. Now, the, I need to say a couple of things uh, here. What does it mean that you can't create the lack of the Quran? So somebody might sit and just write, you know, scribble something and say, well, well, th this is for me, is as good as the Quran. Uh, people have. I mean, I've got a couple, there, there, some Christians uh, have uh, cobbled together some Arabic um, claiming, oh, this is just as good as the Quran. When you look at it, it's basically a pastiche of the Quran <laughs> with just a few tinkered bits. So it's really a bit of a fraud. But um, no, the, the attempts so far have, have apparently been quite unsuccessful. Okay, so let's just kind of, forget where we are because we look at the Quran always we look back 14 mm. centuries after the Quran. let's go back all the way to the time of the Prophet and try to imagine the environment there right. so here you have a minority religious minority all following uh, a new prophet who's making this claim through the book that is, is being revealed to him now the Arabs not all of them but many of them were very good at producing poetry they had a lot of poetry, a lot of poets. In fact, um, poetry was one of the kind of um, tools they used uh, to, you know, attack other tribes, etc., praise themselves. So language was a powerful weapon for the Arabs that they used all the time. Mm -hmm. Yet, and, and in that environment, because this is this kind of um, uh, challenge was set throughout the revelation of the Quran, most of these verses are actually Meccans. So they're not even from Medina, which means they were, that's when the Prophet ﷺ was in a minority. So he wow. wasn't, for instance, in a position to burn and kill somebody who would come up with something and claim, well, this is similar to the Quran, yes, yeah. right? That's Obviously, true. burning scriptures is a very, more than any new phenomenon, which has become very popular in Europe, unfortunately. Region recently, unfortunately, yes. Yeah, yeah. but uh, the Prophet ﷺ wasn't actually in a position to stop people from producing what they claim to be something similar to the Quran. Now, let's imagine... It's a very bold claim then to make, isn't it? So you get a new prophet on the scene, he, yeah. uh, he, he shares this scripture and say, hey, you know, this is unique, it's inimitable. You can't copy, you can't reproduce it from your own sources. Yeah. Try it, try it, just have a go. Yeah. It's actually inviting people to, in a sense, debunk it, if you like, because, hey, you know, try and uh, copy it if you can. So it's as you say, particularly these are Meccan verses, which I hadn't, I didn't actually know that. I didn't know when they were revealed, to be honest. That that's even more extraordinary, a position of, of extreme minority status with a hostile environment where people could easily have crushed these claims had they been able to uh, indeed do what the Quran invites yeah. them to do. If anybody and somebody would have done that, there are two ways of looking at it. Somebody might have said, okay, well, let me just write down something and say, well, this is, this is your challenge. I've met your challenge. 
Mm. That's something similar. Your yes. book is in divine. Now, Indeed. imagine those majority, huge majority of disbelievers, they would have jumped at that. They would have just said, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So what are we to conclude? What are we to conclude? Surely nobody, nobody managed to produce anything that can even be used in a kind of the most unconvincing way by the disbelievers themselves to claim mm -hmm. that a similar book, a book similar to the Quran, has been created by a human being. Mm -hmm. There's none. Um, and nothing happened, even though the mind. So, this is a small minority who had this book, this particular Prophet وسلم, had this ongoing and kind of standing challenge, if you like. And for mm -hmm. whatever reason, it doesn't matter how the uh, hostility increased, changed nature, etc. This challenge continued and was never. So they fought him, they uh, besieged him, uh, they forced him to migrate. They mm -hmm. did everything you can imagine. They insulted him. They claimed he was insane. He was. It's just about anything you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Yet the one thing they couldn't do, which supposedly was the clay, the, the easiest for them to do, because they were all Arabs and they had some really people with very good with the language, they could not produce anything that they can use and say, here you have it, Muhammad, that we've produced something. They could not do that. Mm -hmm. I read once um, a very good opinion by a scholar, I think his surname is Sa'i, uh, an, an Arabic, um, he's an Arab. And he, he made a very good point, which is, when you look at the Quran and the how it, it set the challenge, you have to remember the context within which, because we're now familiar with the Arabic language uh, because of what the Quran did to the Arabic language. It right. actually advanced the language. Yes. We now, in a very different position, We, if you want to think about, you have to kind of take a phenomenological approach mm. to understand what things looked like at the time. So those Arabs, when they look at the Quran, is not like Lu'a looks at the Quran today. Lu'a was born as an, an, an Arab, mm -hmm. uh, his native uh, mother language is, is Arabic. Yes, I had to learn proper Arabic at school, etc. But my native language and I, I kind of was born in an environment where the language is mature. The language has reached levels where people can write brilliant pieces of literary, etc. That is what we miss today when we think about the time of the Prophet Sallallahu that did not exist. Very interesting. If, 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 if I was born, a, 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 again, an Arab at the time, this book that today sounds familiar would have looked really, really strange. Mm -hmm. And I could have just struggled. The language that I'm familiar with that is very different from what I see there. And I could not produce anything like it. Now, that's what happened. However, there's an, a minority opinion. Um, it, it's um, attributed usually to one of the early Mu'tazilites. Uh, his name is Ibrahim. Um, um, and um, Ibrahim al-Nabam. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he, he died early in the third century. And there's a concept associated with him, but it's actually uh, earlier. They call it in Arabic sarfa, sarfa, from the verb sarfa or turn away. Uh, what they say, they say, well, actually, the Quran, the, the, what's miraculous here isn't that the Quran, the like of the Quran cannot be produced. However, nobody could have produced because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prevented them from doing that. Ah, uh, right. If you see the difference between kind of the, 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 the a bit of subtle difference. Now, this is a, a minority, tiny, tiny minority, because uh, the, the, the it just doesn't come. It, 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 frankly, it makes an even an equally kind of supernatural, obviously, claim here, because that's saying that you can't people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stopped even people from writing a single line to claim mm -hmm. that this is Quran. This is a very tiny opinion. Um, Muslim scholars in general disagree with it. And it is an, an old, it looks like an old, uh, kind of opinion that came from somewhere and some claim it is not um, it came from abroad if you like from other cultures it is not necessarily 
something that uh, Muslims kind of would have believed in. It sounds like a strange idea. Because what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about, he's not saying, I'm going to stop you from doing that. He's saying that it, whatever you do, whatever you produce, isn't going to be like the Quran. No. That's what he's saying. Um, okay, so moving on to the subject of the miracles of the Quran. Mm. And um, there are, there are the, from very early on, scholars recognized two kind of types uh, of um, miraculousness of the Quran. Why is it inevitable? But one of them is the literary form that we spoke about. Mm. But the other, with the, which is equally important, is that how it dealt with al ghaib or the unseen. Mm. So, and the unseen in the Quran is usually split into kind of um, two two forms: um, unseen of the of past events, um, history that yes. the Prophet Sallallahu and his people could not have had access to. Um, and so um, you have a, 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 an ayah, for instance, a verse that says, "Tilka min anba al ghayb nuhiha ilayka." ما كنت تعلمه تعلمها أنت ولا قومك من قبل هذا. That is from the news of the unseen that we which we revealed to you. You knew it not, neither you nor your people before this, as in before the Quran. You had no idea. And you probably remember Paul as well. Um, I um, have also argued in the past as uh, others that uh, that actually the uh, rejection. Uh, of refutation of the claim of the crucifixion of Jesus is itself a, a, a miracle, but in a different form, because that wasn't that it, it went even against what's already uh, people believed in across the board. Now that's about past events. And then you've got future. So the Quran is also uh, talks about future events. We're going to uh, later talk about uh, one of them. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously, anything that happens in the future is unseen from the perspective of the Quran at the time. Anything mm -hmm. that happens in the future is unseen. Um, over time, the Muslim scholars developed more, kind of um, built more on the earlier studies, if you like. And this has started to develop on, on the more matured as a subject of study. And then you started people hearing people talking about other aspects of uh, inevitability and miraculousness of the Quran. For instance, Qadi Abdul Jabbar, even though he's from the fourth uh, century, even though he's a Mu'tazilite, very well-known Mu'tazilite, he spoke about uh, the Quran was miraculous in the, in the way it, it, it addressed reason. It reasoned with people. Mm. So that it was uh, miraculous in this way. And obviously over time, in particular, um, in the later centuries, people started talking about things like scientific um, miracles, um, new miracle miracles, and then you had then kind of subcategories. So you've got medical miracles, astronomical miracles. So that kind of um, uh, kind of developed uh, into a, a big, big um, subject: legal, moral. All of these people started talking about to show that well, this is. You know, these are all aspects of mir miraculousness uh, of the Quran. So I'm going to give some examples here. Okay. So knowledge of the unseen. Um, the knowledge. This is one example um, about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which is used uh, by scholars to show that it. O Messenger, announce that which has been revealed to you from your Lord, and if you do not, then you have not conveyed his message, and Allah will protect you from people. Now, uh, obviously, you know, the, the Prophet ﷺ was living in a very dangerous environment. Um, he was at war. There were numerous people who wanted to kill him, hmm. and indeed, uh, there were even um, attempt made as his at his life, which were unsuccessful. This promise, Allah will protect you from people. Is it 
again, what I call high um, kind of high risk claim. Because what would have happened if somebody killed the prophet? So who said that really, really must be confident 100% that was not going to happen. Again, really strange in that environment, in this animosity, hostility, aggression, war, everything. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given this kind of, this promise, um, guarantee you will, you, you will protect you from people. You're not going to be, be killed. And obviously this is kind of similar to the high risk uh, challenge that he said in the Quran repeatedly when he said, you can't produce the like of it. Yeah, remarkable. That is no, but well, let me look at it differently. Frankly, no, no human being would have taken that risk. It just doesn't, you know, it doesn't sound kind of reasonable to take that risk. But no. that's what the what the Quran tells us. And then the other kind of example is this is also used to show that there were um, kind of prophecies, or knowledge of the ancient about the Muslims in general. So this is one example. Or do they say we are an alliance that shall be victorious? The alliance will be defeated and they will turn their backs, the retreat. Again, that is presented uh, as, um, as, a, as, as a prophecy. And indeed, the Muslims prevailed. Okay, so I call the Quran a miracle of miracles because the Quran as a whole is a miracle, but it also contains miracles. So I gave an example or two earlier, but there's one particular example that I would like to mention here. Oh, yes. So the Romans have been defeated in the nearest land, but they, after they did defeat, will prevail within a few years. Allah is the matter before and after, meaning Allah, everything is in the hand of Allah. And that day, so the day when they, when the Romans will be victorious, the believers will rejoice in the victory of Allah. He gives victory, victory to whom he wills. In other words, the Romans would lose first and then they will become victorious and at the same time, the Muslims will also rejoice, as in will be victorious. So what is this exactly talking about? The, obviously, this is a Meccan uh, verse. So that was revealed before the year 622, uh, when the migration happened. It would have been earlier by some, by a few years. So this is talking about uh, the Byzantine Sasanian War, which um, which happened between 602 to 628, the um, the, the Sasanians uh, were led by a king called uh, Khosrow II, mm. and um, at the beginning, they actually were winning that really long uh, depleting war uh, mm. with the Romans. Um, and uh, they continued to make inroads um, and and uh, win battles against uh, the Romans. Um, the nearest land here seems to refer to Anatolia. When so the the Sasanians, Sasanians went as far as there. So Anatolia, by the way, of course, is today's Turkey in terms of its geographical area. Yeah, yeah, because they are in the second uh, half of the uh, second kind of decade, uh, they invaded uh, Anatolia and um, and then uh, were victorious there. However, it's, it was around 622 or so when things started to turn in favor of the Romans. Hmm. At the time, the emperor was Heraclius and things changed until they actually started winning the war one battle after another um, in the year 
624, there was um, the, the, the Romans uh, attacked through Anatolia and Persia. So, th so there were quite uh, a lot of um, battles won there. Mm. And then in 628, uh, the Persians were in such a shambolic state that they killed their own king. So um, Khosrow II was killed by his own people. So we have two kind of two dates, 624 and 628 to stop at. In 624, in March, that's how you know it's dated usually, that's when the Battle of Bedr, the victory of Bedr, happened. So that could be the victory that the ayah is referring to here. Mm. The other date with the 628, that's when we have the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Mm. Again, it was looked at as a victory because in that treaty, the disbelievers conceded to allow the Muslims to go for Umrah the following year and allow them to go into Mecca. So the Muslims had grown in size and stature to force um, such um, a, a treaty that would have been undreamt of earlier. So scholars usually link one or the other. We've got mm -hmm. those kind of two dates, uh, possible dates. Now, let me Okay, go back to stop there. And I'm gonna change subject completely and talk about an English gentleman called Edward Gibbon. Oh yes, a historian. Yeah. That is somebody in, in the fall of the Roman Empire, very famous work. Enlightenment. Yeah, I think he was alive in the eighteenth century, uh, and in what's called an Enlightenment thinker. Um his, I remember um Jonathan Professor Jonathan Brown at Georgetown University. Uh, a year or so ago said he was he's an historian of course he was uh reading this book and it's still much of it is still used by historians today as a a really reliable work on the history of the uh, of the roman empire its decline and fall uh, although he was a bit of a anti-supernaturalist skeptic i think when it came to miracles so i don't want to steal your thunder on this but it, it is a great work and i i, I have it here it's very long <laughs> mm. and not, not only that he was actually quite um Islamophobic, let's call them using yeah. a new term. It's also Christophobic. His comments on uh, Christianity right. weren't at all flattering. So I think, I'm not sure he liked religion per se. I think he was that kind of skeptical enlightenment attitude. So, Even though he's, you know, he was writing history, but at times was moralizing while writing history. So that wasn't the criticisms uh, yes. of his work that kind yeah. of ventured away from what he should be doing. Yeah. Uh, but yes, he's a very famous historian. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, he had, he, he said some kind of quite offense of, you know, offensive things about the Prophet yeah. yeah. But what I'm gonna read out now is a paragraph from uh, one of the volumes, I think volume four mm -hmm. uh, in the edition I use. And this is what he says. Remember, we've just spoken about the uh, Byzantine Sasanian war. He's, so, quote, placed on the verge of the two great empires of the East, Mahomet, as he calls, calls him, observed with secret joy the progress of their mutual destruction. And in the midst of the Persian triumphs, he ventured to foretell that before many years should elapse, victory should again turn to the banners of the Romans. Now, why am I kind of uh, quoting this, um, not as much as the quote itself, this particular quote, if we can go back to the screen, there but really because of what he says immediately after it. And I'm gonna, uh, Paul, I don't know Latin, and I'm kind of trying my luck with something, but you can correct me if I got it wrong, but I'm pretty sure you'll understand what I'm talking about, but I think we would need a bit of explanation uh, to view or some of them anyway. Oh, so, right. I've Just come up... Gibbonum, yeah, that's a... Uh, okay. right. mm. So, for those who don't know, would you like... This is, you know, testimonium. 
testimony of, of Gibbon uh, in, in Latin. It's just, I mean, his, his uh, well, what he stated about something, his right. witness. So, and that is a reference to Testimonium Flavium, which is... Oh. Fabius, jo Josephus, no less. Josephus. Joseph, uh, first century Jewish historian who wrote, well, you can tell us about that. Sorry, I'm yeah. telling So <laughs> Josephus uh, has a very famous yeah. passage in one of his books in which he mentions Jesus. And yeah. this has attracted the most interest in yeah. any piece of his writings and still the subject of disagreement between scholars. Most think that it was partly authentic, partly uh, you know, uh, that, that's the, my understanding is that's the consensus. It's not like uh, there isn't much disagreement that the passage has been tampered with in just by later Christian scribes Correct. for very good reasons. This is not really argued about Correct. so much Correct. because he, he, he talks as if he's a Christian, uh, uh, you know, uh, randomly Correct. at this point. Whereas everything else he ever wrote, clearly he was not a Christian, he was a, a, a Jew. So this has clearly been corrupted, this text, unfortunately. Correct. So the, the, the issue is. Uh, the scholarly reconstruction of exactly how much is authentic and how much isn't, um, that is debated, I think. Yes, uh, you're absolutely right. I think there is also a minority of scholars who think the whole thing was implanted by someone else. Yeah, um, yeah. And I, that's, I am of this opinion. And mm -hmm. I think when we did um, a program on the historicity of the crucifixion, mm. uh, I kind of presented a detailed critique uh, of uh, what Josephus says there. And yeah. I agree with those who think it's probably come from Eusebius, but that's that's ah. obviously a different story for now. But the point is, um, I'm trying to say that uh, Christians are very proud and always talk about this particular passage. Oh, yes, well, sorry, Jeffrey, I just wanted to tell you a, a story uh, here, um, mm -hmm. just to break up the narrative a bit. Um, I remember some years ago when I was uh, a Christian, uh, I went on an alpha course. The alpha course is the most successful, um, if you like, uh, introduction to Christianity in the world now. It was actually created at HTB, Holy Trinity Brompton here in London in Knightsbridge, a very successful evangelical Anglican church. And I mentioned this, I went on this course because like millions and millions of people worldwide have been hugely successful uh, introduction to Christianity. And I went on this course um in uh, at htb actually um and um i was shocked because i knew well, what we'd just been talking about i knew this even then you know i wasn't that i wasn't that ignorant and on the course which is a very reputable course you know some christian academics approve of it the archbishop of canterbury approved of it they quoted josephus in its corrupted form as if it was authentic and historical i josephus said that jesus uh, was a man if he could be called a man who died on the cross and rose again from the dead i thought what what you're quoting this corrupted inauthentic fake text to on on a course on christianity to convert us to christianity and i was appalled and uh, i because this is a fake text and the author the compilers of the course would have known this i would think um why are you quoting fake fake text to uh, bolster your claims? So I actually complained. <laughs> and what was interesting is um, they admitted it. They, yeah, we, we know it's a fake text. But, you know, it, it, it's, it's how the text has come down to us. And anyway, it's true what he says. Uh, it's true, a, a claim, even though he didn't say it. So I thought, oh, my God, you know, this is this is not how you do things. You don't quote texts you know are fake to justify your religion. I was just shocked that they had the gall to do that and pass it off to people like, you could spot a fake a mile off. Like all scholars know it's a fake. Absolutely. So I, I, I was just really disappointed that, we, that they were passing this off uh, in Christian apologetics. And I, now I'm not saying that Christians in general always do this, but this is the most successful evangelistic introduction of Christianity on the planet in the last decade or 20 years and they're they're using fake text to justify their beliefs and I was stunned and appalled and I was a Christian by the way you know I didn't want it to be bad but it was bad anyway I just thought I'd share that little I think story. I mean one obvious one one reason is that it is the earliest non-christian reference non from the first yeah. century so exactly. they come because of that. Fruit. They couldn't resist the tempting fruit, the forbidden fruit. Oh, I'll just have this forbidden fruit and try it as well. This forbidden, oh, but it's poisonous. You can't use it. Oh, well. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so you have it, but you're absolutely right. Uh, scholars definitely, the majority, the very, very tiny minority would say uh, this is completely the writing of um, Josephus. Is, it makes no sense. Yeah. So the difference right. we have here is, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. so this comes from, as I said, the decline and fall of the ah. Roman Empire, which you mentioned earlier. Great work. But, and it's still, as, as I said, by the way, this is still highly, if you Google this and look at the, uh, I've looked at the, uh, I remember a year or two, I looked at the Google webpage. I mean, it's still highly regarded by historians today, like a couple of centuries after. I mean, th there are issues with it, uh, but overall, uh, scholars, historians are still very impressed with it as a resource for history of the Roman Empire. It's a yeah. remarkable testimony to Gibbon's brilliance, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And and what and, and also the, the comment that uh, Gibbon makes, which follows the earlier passage I, I read out, um, you know, it's nobody claims uh, that Gibbon was a Muslim and nobody claims that this was not written by Gibbon. So my argument is that we have Muslims more of a claim to a testimonium than those who use Josephus. And here is what, what he says. Oh, yeah. At the time when this prediction is said to have been delivered, no prophecy could be more distant from its accomplishment since the first 12 years of Heraclius announced the approaching dissolution of the empire. Amazing. It, it wasn't until the year 622, Heraclius um, became empire in 610. So 12 years, it was miserable. And it also from 22, as I mentioned earlier, when things started to turn in 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 their favor in the favor of the romans and and they look at that and say well you couldn't have made it up could you uh, no. if he's a false prophet this would have been a lunatic thing to do because yeah. you're putting your career on the line you know as a fake prophet but i mean i'm making a prophecy here it really uh, how can it possibly come true i mean this is this is a way to destroy your career really and you know say no sane I can use this term, no saying fake prophet, that makes any sense, would bother to make such a prediction in the Quran because it's, it's an open goal waiting to be refuted, you know. So yeah. it's an extraordinary statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think let's just put aside uh, the slides for for now, just to talk okay. about. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. So. Let's just take a step back and think once again about the subject of the miracles of the Prophet So we looked at the Quran. So the Quran is a miracle because it was revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it also contains miracles. Mm -hmm. And we spoke about it in some detail. Now, the other, the other kind of miracles of the Prophet we, that we will focus on from now on is really where people usually kind of talk or what they usually mean when they say miracles of the Prophet, as in things he performed, things right. he did, because his role in the Quran was only a receiver. He mm. only received the, mm. uh, the, the revelation. He shared it, communicated it. And then he set the example in following the revelation. That was really his role. So that's all. The other miracles that is the subject of you know, controversy, disagreement, as you said earlier, Paul, is, is those where he is said to have performed or experienced something supernatural. Yes. And what I would call also miracle here is that something that is usually usually that has witnesses. So something that has claimed, been claimed, but also it was witnessed by someone. At times, uh, the witnesses or people who accepted did not necessarily witness it, but they accepted it for whatever reason, in their circumstances, given what they know about the claimant and whatever is being, you know, they understood the claim at the time, they accepted it. As such, it's a miracle for them. It was a miracle. That's what happened. So. So there are two kinds of kind of separate, if you like, things that differ from the Quran. These are experiences, call them, or feats that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, had, which are mirac miraculous. Some of these are mentioned in the Quran. 
and that will take me back to the point you raised earlier. Some of them are mentioned in the Quran. However, they are not miraculous because they are mentioned in the Quran. They are by and of themselves. So they are miraculous whether they were mentioned in the Quran or not. Mm. They are. Now, the, the Quran, I want just to put a little bit more kind of background and perspective to this. The Quran mm. describes the Prophet Sallallahu he talks about him and he says, فَإِنَّكَ بِأَعْيُنِنَا You are, for you are in our eyes. That's what he says about the Prophet Sallallahu Allah in the Quran. What does that mean? I mean, he obviously, he, he sees you, he sees me, he sees what we're doing, he sees everybody all the time, everything. فَإِنَّكَ بِأَعْيُنِنَا uh, You are in our eyes. It's talking about the care and special intimacy and closeness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Well, what does that mean? So what does that mean? So uh, uh, we all, you know, um, if you like, report to the same creator, mm. uh, see by the same creator, and uh, we all servants of the one creator. The difference is that the Prophet sallallahu had a relationship with that creator we don't have. Mm. That's the special closeness, nearness. And it is that particular nearness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing here when he speaks about him specifically. And he says, you, Muhammad, you are in our eyes. So we look after you. In the same way, for instance, when he told Moses and Aaron, اِذْهَبَا إِنَّنِي مَعَكُمَا أَسْمَعُ وَأَرَى I am with you, when he sent them to Pharaoh, I am with you here and see. So I'm going to hear and see what's going to happen, and I'm there to help you. In other words, it's not just there to watch what's going on. I am going to get involved and support you throughout. So why is this important um, when we kind of try to imagine what it means to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because there is at times... Uh, this assumption, um, probably some Muslims also have, that we know everything about the Prophet Sallallahu We know everything about what he experienced, what happened to him. This is just couldn't be uh, further from the mm -hmm. truth. Mm -hmm. We are told some of what he went through, of, of some of what he went through, what he experienced. There is no way that what was made public is all that it is. Mm. It just makes no sense. The, he had this private relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only some of it has become kind of revealed to us and made public. So we know that he experienced, as we will see shortly, Al Isra, the night journey. Oh, but yes. that could have been kept secret, could have been stayed there, nobody knows about it and it would have been left as a personal experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm pretty sure familiar, you're familiar, Paul, with the um, you know, Western scholars who at times when they write about the Quran and the Prophet Sallallahu but in particular about the Quran and how the Quran is developed over time, how it was, this verse was this edition, this wording, and then he forgot, remembered, then he added this and that, and then you have a whole genesis uh, of the Quranic text developed by scholar X. Mm. The way they set out to talk about it in order to undermine and deny that the Quran is miraculous, the claim they make is actually nothing short of supernatural. Mm. Because they are claiming they knew about this man who lived 1400 years ago, whether they believe he was a prophet or not, but the minor details, they talk about him and how he thought, and how we ended up with this Quran is just mind-boggling. What you're doing, Professor so-and-so, you're actually denying that the Quran is a divine book, but the alternative theory you're giving us is actually supernatural. Yeah, I mean, just, just I mean, this is a very good point I think you're making, uh, that this kind of methodology that you get in some many academics, 
uh, where they all had these incredibly confident, assured reconstructions of what really happened, detailed textual analysis, and you can see the the narrative, the historical narrative being uh, elaborated in highly uh, compelling ways, apparently. But the problem is the scholars disagree with each other, so each one will have this compelling, highly assured, confident narrative, um, which is in fact largely speculative. Um, it is largely conjectural, but it gives the appearance, as you say, of having supernatural powers. Wow, they can see right into the past and what motivated Jesus or any other figure in the scriptures and how his words became this and what happened. To Very elaborate. But the what calls them out is the fact that these discrete separate reconstructions are often mutually contradictory. So they can't really be all be true by definition. If any of them are true, one might be true, but they can't all be true. Um, and, and this is something that has been remarked on by some scholars, um, uh, Dale Allison from Princeton, for example, a great, uh, one of America's great New Testament scholars, I've had a huge privilege of interviewing him several times. You know, he, he remarks on, on this and, uh, and it's self-defeating because I, I, at the end of the day, the, the public reading this stuff, they get wind of this. You think, hang on, Tom Wright has written this amazingly confident reconstruction. Yeah, this is the truth. And then you get another figure like Jimmy Dunn and you get another figure like Dale Martin himself or uh, from Yale. Um, but they're not, none of them are the same. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's, they're not really scientific in that sense of verifiable, um, objective, quantifiable um, results. They are the creations of the individual scholar's mind, but uh, as you say, often projected on the innocent public as, as if they are the assured results of criticism. Not really, because they all contradict each other. They are. And also, uh, obviously, what they do, they start with from an, they start with some kind of methodologies that mm. may be may be partly justifiable in the case of the Bible, where you have books that we don't know where they came from, yes. who wrote them, over exactly. what period of time, etc. So they're basically, applying, what, yeah, they're applying the biblical methodology to the Quran. I mean, that is explicitly what they are doing. Exactly. Okay, it worked for the Bible, this library of books, which are written, many of them are written hundreds or thousands of years after the events they claim to purport to describe. Right, we're going to use that for the Quran. And, and, and exactly the same. And, and this has been well commented on. This is exactly what happens. Yeah, and obviously, uh, when they, when you start with this assumption, say I'm going to you know apply uh, historical criticism the way it's applied to the yeah. Bible. Well, hold on, uh, you're you're starting with a false assumption because yeah. you're talking about completely different piece of work. Whatever you believe it is, yes, it's, the, the 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 circumstances, the historical circumstances we're talking about are completely and utterly different. There's a huge yeah. element of certainty. In the case of the Quran, that corresponds to a huge element of uncertainty. In the case of the Bible, when you yeah. have much uncertainty, you might as well tell us what you think and be as creative as you can, but you can't do that when it comes to the Quran, when you have to be constrained by what is available and known about the book. They don't do that. Think exactly as creatively as they think about the Bible, because they don't have a reference point in the Bible, it's just all out there, you know, up in the air. Make up what you like. You mm. can't do the same with the Quran. No. Now, I, I, I mean, to be fair, sorry, I've just, I, I, I know I'm interrupting a lot, but just one final quick point here. Um, although what you're saying is true, absolutely, um, there are there are, there is a new generation. I, I understand a new generation of uh, yes. scholars uh, in in the West. I do stress this, and I'm thinking of Professor Nikolai Sinai. Uh, from Oxford University, uh, who a friend of mine uh, is his supervisor, uh, not his, not Sinai's supervisor, his supervisor under him. Um, and, and in his recent work, I've got a copy here, introduction, a critical introduction to the Quran. So he's a Western scholar. He's not a Muslim at all. He, he acknowledges this point you're making and says it's a mistake. It's a methodological spec made by an older generation of scholars, and, and it needs to be dealt with and challenged and overcome. So this is beginning to be acknowledged and challenged by even Western scholars now, just, just you know, using the biblical methodology on the Quran. It's wrong in principle, in practice, and it leads to distorted results. So um, hopefully there is a paradigm shift, there is a paradigm shift uh, amongst uh, uh, younger scholars. I mentioned one from Oxford uh, who, who I've read, and he's very clear that this is a mistake. Uh, I think, it, yes, I agree with that, but I'll, I'll add to this. In the mm. case of Sinai, for instance, yeah, because he's very much, um, you know, involved in historical criticism work. Yeah, the problem with that, if you, 
if you look, I think it's probably in the introduction in, of the book you're talking about, he makes it clear yes. that uh, anything that could not, ha if I remember the word, it could not happen today, could not have happened in the past. Yes. No, you, you were right. No, he, he still uses that methodology. No, you, I, I'm not defending. I'm not saying I agree with everything. A, yeah, a lot of what I think is very helpful. But and I remember discussing this with a postgraduate researcher at Oxford University who knows him, who's a Muslim. And I said, look, if you read this introduction, the one you're referring to, which I studied, um, you know, this guy's got assumptions, philosophical assumptions about the nature of history itself, which is anti-Islamic. Uh, itself is incompatible with this. Never mind about the particular, particular conclusions or the analysis. The very method itself uh, is is going to lead to certain outcomes which are completely inimical to Islam. And this is a philosophical question. It's not a, like a scientific question or a scholarly one. It's an assumption that he brings to it, and it's rooted in the historical critical method. It's not his personal invention. He is using the standard model, as it's called, the HTM, the historical critical method. Yeah which uh, Jonathan Brown, by the way, another historian, has discussed in his book on the introduction to Hadith. And he brilliantly exposes the bias within Western scholarship. But you're absolutely right. The more particular point about just using biblical um, categories and methodologies to apply to Quran, it is accepted. But you're right, there's still big problems. And that's why yeah. it's actually quite toxic for Muslims. Yeah. And also, and this is not, uh, yes. all, it's not only kind of about the Quran. I think this is a different subject. Let's just say a couple of things that since we yeah. kind of um, started talking um, about it. Because uh, yeah. what you're doing, if somebody makes that claim, that assumption, yeah. you have constrained what's available, what's possible to happen, what yeah. could have happened exactly. on completely on an arbitrary basis. Yes, It's my personal preference. There is no supernatural. And because of that, I am going to read history um, yes. in, in a way that excludes completely this supernatural element from it. In the course of doing that, if there is supernatural, if there is supernatural, your history can only be flowed. It yes. just by definition. And Absolutely. that's the problem there. And yeah. I think, so yes, and, and, but what I love about these writings is frankly the sophistication of it. Yes, they're Look very... This, wow, that yeah. is some achievement. Unfortunately, yes. it might not have not much relevance to what really happened in history. But yes. as it is, it's a kind of a brilliant piece of creativity. But anyway, that kind of took us a little bit further. Sorry, uh, from, no, 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 absolutely. Uh, very important point, Paul. Okay. Um, so we said we're going to now focus on the miracles of the Prophet وسلم, other than the Quran. Right. And there are sources which we're going to have to, obviously, we look at. The Qur'an is one of them, but there are other sources, including hadith. The Qur'an is more significant in this discussion than the other sources, including hadith, uh, for two different, for two reasons. Theologically, because we all Muslims believe that the Qur'an is the word of God. Everything there was preserved. There are statements in the Quran itself, of course, uh, to confirm that, that the Quran has not been changed, is completely the word of God. A similar claim cannot be made about hadith, and I'm talking general here. Of course, the literature of hadith uh, kind of documented and preserved for us a lot of the Prophet's sayings, deeds, history, etc. But hadith is an area where we can't, as a term and as, as a genre, we can't use it in the same way we use uh, the Quran. One thing. Second, the Quran, of course, as we all know, and where even, uh, you know, Western scholars have now been forced to accept, was written very, very early mm. uh, in the history of Islam. It was being written as the Quran was being revealed. It was being written down and it was compiled uh, very early uh, in that history. Whereas obviously what we have uh, of hadith have some some kind of history, longer history. So they're much later books. So from this point of view, uh, from this point of view, uh, the Quran is kind of different and more significant. Having said that, we will obviously have to deal with hadith. Because obviously the hadith 
preserves for us a lot of the history of the Prophet ﷺ. But I'm going to start with, um, with the Quran first. So, we're going to, I'm going to review five, what I call five miracles in the Quran. Okay. The first of which is the well-known night journey. So this is the night journey, mm -hmm. um, the well-known famous miracle. And this is the verse that mentions it. Exalted is he who took a servant by night from Al-Masjid Al-Haram to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, Masjid Al-Haram being Mecca, Masjid Al-Aqsa being Palestine, whose surroundings we have a blessing to show, we are blessed to show him of our signs. Indeed, he is the hearing, the seeing. Now, there is no disagreement whatsoever among scholars uh, Muslim scholars, that this reports a um, miracle uh, experienced by the Prophet ﷺ. In terms of looking at the wording of it, um, we're going to do some. Right. Why, why is it, a, I mean, to the uninitiated, why is it a miracle? A miracle because uh, what we're talking about here, the whole, this whole event happened over a few hours. Right. So the Prophet ﷺ was at home, in the Masjid al-Haram, which is where he lived anyway in that area. Mm. And the Masjid al-Aqsa in Palestine, so between Mecca and obviously Masjid al-Aqsa. Thousands, thousands of miles away, just right. obviously, right. thousands of miles away, uh, the, just the distance between these two places. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's why it's considered uh, to be a miracle. But so then you, went, here, you, went, you went from A to B in a couple of hours, obviously right. uh, a miracle. Right. Right. Whereas I think it takes a month, whatever it used to take yeah. that particular journey one way yeah. at the time. And then um, the wording here, I will just say a couple of things about the wording also. So not only the reports, which is pretty clear, but I would want to also some um, kind of uh, references to the miraculous yeah. nature of this uh, experience. Exalted is he. Um, and this is a, a, the word. Um, Subhan al-ladhi asra bi'abdi. Subhan is a, is a word that used for exaltation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the way it starts indicates something about the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then it becomes more specific and it says he took him by night from um, Masjid al-Haram in Mecca to Palestine. Mm. And then he says whose surroundings we have blessed. So that reference is a second reference that something unusual was taking place there. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on to say, to show him of our signs, to show him of our signs. So this is, this, this is not natural signs. We're talking here something right. miraculous. So that's yeah. why it's, um, it's, it's accepted by all really even those who aren't particularly pro miracles cannot deny that this text is completely clear that it is uh, a miracle mm -hmm. now there are some some scholars argue the a minority that the the journey this journey was in soul not in body and soul some yes yes that's the right. majority the majority accept that it was both in in body and soul it's a miracle either way of course i mean correct, I, i'm not correct. i'm not taking size in this but i'm just saying it's miraculous whatever the precise nature correct. of it correct and then the a related uh, miracle is the heavenly ascension or the mi'raj Gosh. and now this is described in some really what i would call really difficult ambiguous kind of terminology or terms in, in about 18 verses of a Najm. I have kind of just copied one of them by the star when it descends and then it goes on. While he was in the higher horizon, talking about the prophet, then he approached and descended and then goes on something else. And he saw certainly of the greatest signs of his Lord. Now, this is taken to have happened right after the Isra night journey. By the way, we happen to be in the month of Isra as we speak. Mm. So, as in, you know, 
use what he traditionally um, taken to have happened in. And uh, so this has happened right after uh, the Isra. What, there are a number of references here, again, to talk about why this was miraculous and the fact that it's something that happened in heaven. One of them is the reference to the higher horizon. This term is related to another term in the Quran that's called Al-Mala'ul A'la. The Al-Mala'ul A'la may be translated as those who high above. And it's usually a reference to the angels. Al-Mala'ul A'la. And here it's using the same term. Mm. And then it talks about how he approached, descended. Some really, um, if you think of the experience and how described in the book of Hadith, is a clearly a place and experience that we cannot be familiar with. Mm. Language can do so much to kind yeah. of give us an idea about what he saw. But the way it ends is also very interesting. He certainly saw of the greatest signs of his Lord. Now, if you remember, when we looked at the a verse of Isra, night journey earlier, it says, min ayatina, to show him of our signs. And then look at how this verse, this passage ends, which is in a completely different chapter, by the way, Surah al It says, he certainly saw of the greatest signs of his Lord. So this kind of confirms, as I see it, the continuation and the link between uh, these two events. And I think in terms of, of course, in terms of um, being a supernatural event, again, no disagreement whatsoever there. Uh, the language is very kind of, at times, difficult to kind of understand what experience it, it describes, but there are kind of references there to something happening in heaven and involves signs, seeing, witnessing signs of the greatest signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can mm. only mean something supernatural. This is the second uh, miracle. Now the third is something that isn't usually listed um, among the miracles of the Prophet said, and for reasons I can't really quite understand. So I called it knowing a family secret and I'm talking about a specific event Ah, I know where you're going with this. Yep, okay. <laughs> yeah, but what's surprising, Paul, if you pick any book about the miracles of the Prophet, they mention a lot. For some reason, nobody, I don't know, maybe there are somebody out there who would have kind of pointed out that this is actually a miracle worth mentioning. Yeah, well, it hadn't occurred to me that, yeah, you're right, it is. Uh, um, I, I'm surprised, I mean, you've obviously read the literature, I haven't, that is not listed as one of the, uh, uh, the no. miracles. I mean, I have to say there aren't obviously in English, um, you know, as in books, how many books in English on the miracles of the Prophet? I don't know what I've, you know, I've seen a lot in Arabic. It's right. never there. For me, it's just straightforward miracle. You'll see there. Yeah, it's not, it's not really even kind of a matter of uh, opinion. So here we go. And when the Prophet confided to one of his wives the matter, so when she disclosed it and Allah made him aware of it, he made known, that's to her, Part of it and ignored the part and when he informed her about it she said who informed you of this he said the knowing the accountant informed me as in referring to Allah mm -hmm. now what happened according to books of hadith um, that the Prophet ﷺ confided to Hafsa his wife a matter there's more than one opinion as to what he exactly confided to her, but it looks like uh, that he might have told her of kind of self-imposed prohibition of getting married to a maid servant. Mm. That's one opinion. And the story goes that he told her, obviously we don't know the details, so there was a reason, whatever, mm -hmm. that he told her that and clearly told her not to disclose it to anyone else. But she told Aisha, said Aisha about that. And he then became aware that this is, has happened behind his back mm -hmm. and not what he actually asked uh, Hafsa mm -hmm. to do. And then so he confronted her and he told her, you have 
said this. But what is interesting here in the ayah, he only confronted her with some knowledge of some of what he knew. So he was told whatever the details, he was told the details in full. But when he confronted her, he did not make her aware that he knew the whole story. He just confronted her about a particular issue. Yeah. And that one issue, without even the whole account, was mm. so surprising to her that mm -hmm. she had to ask him, so who told you this? He mm. could not, should not have mentioned, should not have, been, have known. Again, we don't know. I mean, we, I've kind of highlighted the main kind of um, details of the story. But clearly there was something that was seems to be highly secretive, if you like, and almost mm. impossible to know. Mm. Because if it was a matter of Aisha going to the Prophet Sallallahu and she was his wife, of course, mm. and telling him, you would think it would have been straightforward. Yeah, but surely yeah. there was something going on there that she was such surprised and stunned that she had to ask him uh, who told him. Now, there are a couple of things we can say about the event itself. It looks like, and why someone you know might say, well, why would why would Allah Subhanahu wa Taala inform the Prophet Sallallahu about a tiny matter, you know, a family issue like that? It actually was not a small matter. Like I said, we don't know all the details, but how do we know it was not that small matter? This is verse three we're looking at here. Yeah. If you look at that verse four, I don't have it on screen, but I've got it in my notes. It says it's actually it kind of gives the threat. What in if you do repent to Allah, then your hearts have inclined. But if you cooperate against him or make an alliance against him or back each other against. So something clearly serious had taken place there. We don't know what exactly the matter is, but the two of them. And we're told in the books of Hadith that they were Hafsan and, and Aisha. But that's, you know, that's the extent of what we know. But we know from the Quran, it was really quite serious if that's not you know enough as indication if you go to the following verse actually it gets to the point of talking about divorce yes the quality of the prophet divorcing them so if somebody asks why this was highlighted in the quran set as an example and merited a revelation from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the answer is in the quran itself Mm. Don't need to say necessarily, oh, I have to check hadith and, and I'm not sure about this. It actually tells you that in the Quran, it was a very serious matter, even mm. though yeah. we don't know. The it's so serious. It, was, it merited a chapter in the Quran. It, it's uh, in revelation for all time. Uh, extraordinary. Right. Okay, so the, we have uh, looked at um, three miracles. Yep. And then another. it's definitely a miracle, by the way. Well, well done, uh, I must say, Dr. Fitu, for uh, classifying this uh, correctly, because it is a miracle. And um, it, it's one that, as you say, has been overlooked. So certainly one can be added to the list. Thank you. And then um, I've listed the other two together. They're historically um, not, in, they're not necessarily in, the, in historical order, but that's the one. This is a dream about the battle uh, of Petra. Hmm. So, it's the first battle, of course, that was ever fought yeah. by the Muslims. When Allah showed them to you, speaking to Muhammad, وسلم, when Allah showed them to you in your dream as a few, and had He shown them to you as many, you now the address in the plural, so that's talking the, this, the, the uh, believers, the believers would have faulted and would have quarreled, disputed about the matter. But Allah saved you. In other words, there was a vision, a dream, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed the Prophet um, a, 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 in a forthcoming battle that's going to happen between the Muslims and the non-Muslims. In that dream, in that visionary dream, they looked smaller in number than they really were going to be. And the justification for that, as the I explains, is that had he because he had he would have had you know he would have had to tell the the, the Muslims what's going to happen 
And he would have told them, the Prophet Sallallahu had to tell them exactly things as he saw them. Mm. And that may be another, you know, look at that, wow, how truthful that, that the Prophet is. The, 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 the vision had to show the Prophet that they were smaller in number. If Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala had shown the Prophet their real number, he would have told the Muslims what he saw as is. He would not have changed the vision to say, I saw a vision, forthcoming battle, actually they're small, when in fact he had seen them that they were outnumbered, the Muslims, by much. Uh, and of course, we know from historical sources that usually they, uh, they say they were out, Muslims were outnumbered by one to three. So they were around 313, and then the disbelievers were around a thousand. These are kind of the figures that are yeah, suggested yeah. by sources. And, and what, so what's interesting here is that the kind of honesty, the, the, the accuracy, the truthfulness, this is the same man who's conveying to the people who follow him and those who don't, who had not been follow, become a followers yet, mm. what he receives as is, as it, he doesn't change anything, mm, mm. as is. And then um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on, to complete, and this is the following verse that so follows that. And when he showed them, and when he showed them to you, now again in the plural, addressing the believers, when you met, so when they came close to basically to the fight, yep. the disbelievers saw them small in number, saw the enemy small in number. Mm. And the enemies saw them smaller than mm. they were, even mm. smaller than they were, mm. so that Allah might accomplish a matter already destined, might yeah. accomplish a matter already destined. His very interesting point as well here. Now mm. imagine all the following. If we have the vision, the vision has already been communicated to the believers. Mm. The Muslims basically set out to go and um, ambush a trade caravan led by Abu Sufyan coming from uh, from Syria. Abu Sufyan got wind of that. He informed Quraysh. Yeah. He took a different route, and the Quraysh then sent an army. And what yeah. we're going to end up with is the the battle that uh, between the this army and the Muslims who originally the plan was to ambush Abu Sufyan, mm, mm. the caravan. So so he told them. We're going to have a battle, and this is what is going, they're going to be small in number, etc. When we went there, so in the first case, if you had told them that, well, they're going to be huge, huge. One, three, yeah. most of them would have said, well, we've got nothing to do with that. Madness. Yeah. You would have folded. And when, when they went there and they saw them, if had they, had they seen them as mm. many as they were, they would have faulted again because they would have turned to the Prophet, and, that's yeah. not what you told us. Yeah. They're, they're actually a lot more than we are, and we can't have that. We're going yeah. back. Yes. And so what happened here? The first, the, the, the accuracy of the kind of vision was repeated here again, and the Muslims saw them, saw the enemy as a smaller number, as the Prophet saw them, so it made it easier for them to mm. remember this. As you said, Paul, this is the first battle. It mm. had kind of psychological barrier there. This mm. is this is not like what followed. Battle well, in history, so this was hugely significant, and uh, you know, uh, so the implications of defeat as well would have been, you know, extraordinary for the future. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, so that is kind of a part of uh, a kind of the, the miraculous aspect. Is obviously he saw something uh, that did not, um, you know, they, they there wasn't nobody knew what was going to happen, and then the. The verse, the the chapter then has a verse just before forty three. So this okay. this is describing the battle, the battle scene. When you when you were on the near bank of the valley, and they were on the farther bank, and the caravan we spoke about was below you. Hmm. Had you agreed an appoint on an appointment, you would have failed to meet. So. Given the circumstances, 
I think it's it's 42, isn't it? Uh, Oh, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Paul. That is 42. Yeah. So it's 42, that's that's a typo. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, okay. So it, it, it's what it, this is confirming how this whole thing was set up, arranged, and managed by Allah so it takes place. Wow. Now, we can talk about the Prophet, Sallam, how he planned, how he wanted to raid uh, that particular ambush, that particular caravan, <clears throat> for spoils, whatever and how he maybe wanted to inflict some, um, you know, uh, defeat on the Meccans. You can think of all of that. Yet, what underlines all of these events is actually a supernatural event, mm. not natural. Mm. Mm. The Prophet Sallallahu if you like, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala delegated to him managing it naturally. Mm. But he was managing it supernaturally from mm. Behind the scene, yes. all of this is a plan that was just kind of happening and 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 being fulfilled in, in with time. Very interesting. Again, I, I hadn't classified that in my mind as a miracle, but of course it is. It is. It is. I uh, I think I've seen pretty sure some people who. Maybe not, not this one, maybe the second one anyway. But I think maybe, you know, some other people have, have noted the same. Mm. Uh, so that's that's number four. That's number four. And let's four. remember the number because... Um, okay. The fourth miracle in the Quran to do yeah. with the prophet. Yeah. yeah, the Quran doesn't, you know, has anything miraculous yet. Gibbon knew that. Um, so, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, moving yes. on. Now, number five. A vision of the conquering of conquering Mecca. Uh -huh. Allah has certainly fulfilled his vision to his messenger in truth. You shall truly enter Al-Masjid Al-Haram, if Allah wills, in safety, with your heads, with your heads, heads shaved and hair shortened. Mm. And this is kind of part of what people do when they go for Umrah, pilgrimage, yeah. of course. But not fearing. He knew what you didn't know. So he arranged for that uh, an eye, before that, uh, an eye, a near conquest. Okay, so what are we talking about here? Late in the sixth year of Hijrah, the Prophet وسلم, wanted to go and do Umrah. Remember, up to that point, he was an immigrant living in Mecca. Muslims could not go there. Um, Mecca was a no-go area for them. However, they set out to go and do Umrah. On their way to there, the, 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 the Quraishites, Meccans, got wind of it, and they heard that this is what the Muslims want to do. Uh, so they sent to them uh, somebody who told them that they are not going to be allowed to, to come there and uh, do do the Umrah. So ultimately, the Muslims ended up in a place called Hudaybiyah, mm. where they met with a delegate delegation from the Meccans, and they agreed on a peace treaty, Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And they agreed that in that particular year, they aren't going to go to Al-Masjid Al-Haram and do Umrah. They're going to go back to Medina. But next year, they were going to be allowed to go for Umrah. Yeah. Now that was a concession by the Meccans, of course, but it was also a diplomatic move and a clever move by the Prophet Sallallahu He did not want to kind of um, escalate it further uh, in that particular point in time. Now, the Prophet had already seen a vision. The vision is that they will go there. Now remember, this is also one aspect of kind of strangeness about this vision is that it happened at the time where the Meccans and the Muslims were at war, at war. Yet this this strange verse or vision is a promising actually going there uh, safely. In, uh, in other words, peacefully. It's not talking about going there by arms, uh, fighting the Meccans, taking over Mecca. If yeah. somebody had told anyone in Mecca at the time 
and the Muslims a year earlier, more than a year earlier, that this, how you could end up going to Mecca as in peacefully conquering peacefully, nobody would believe that. And it's not just not, as you say, not through military conquest, not through military domination, uh, but through peace, a peaceful conquest and not fearing. So the idea that, is that there's complete absence of anxiety about the outcome, that their entrance into Mecca, the conquering of Mecca, was a certainty uh, and it will be done uh, tranquilly without any, uh, you know, uh, exertions and fighting and antagonism with the Meccans themselves, those who were opposed to Muhammad. Of course, many Meccans were on Muhammad's side. So, I mean, th th this is another, if he was a fake prophet, um, you know, you wouldn't make a prophecy like this because it's an open invitation to be falsified. You know, you yeah. you, you, you just wouldn't mention it. Well, I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but, you know, hey, you wouldn't you wouldn't set up this promise that you know it is a way to refute your prophethood it's such an obvious own goal so this is another remarkable uh testimony yeah and, and like i said if you in particular all these kind of um, um passages once you've placed them in their historical context mm. suddenly this just to jump at you those references subtleties here and there mm. i love that about the quran paul every time you read those verses you've read them so many times and you study them and then one day you mm. just look something or discover something, notice something you had not noticed, even though you've been reading the verse so many times. Yeah, and, 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 and you see, uh, the, the Gibbons historian, uh, you know, a, a secular Western historian, no friend of Islam or any religion, he, he recognized that it was a prophecy. Uh, he called it a prophecy. And so it's recognized even by the, the enemies of Islam that it's yeah, real. Absolutely. So what happened then? We had it peace treaty some of the some muslims kind of got a bit skeptical about what was going on yeah. they had been they were aware of the vision and what was supposed to happen as unlikely as it sounded to them it was coming from the prophet وسلم, anyway and then in hudaybiyah in fact there was a bit of disagreement and even kind of resistance to the prophet وسلم, yeah, uh, famous. Um, you know, attempt uh, to uh, strike a deal uh, with the with the Meccans, um, and some Sahaba, some companions actually were also kind of were not happy with that. Mm. So what they did, obviously, at the end they agreed because there's also a story that he went, I think, to Um Salama, one of his wives. He was so unhappy and sad that mm. he was being resisted by his own some of their companions. And he went to her and she encouraged him. He told him, don't worry, you do what you need to do. You slaughter your sacrifice, uh, cut short your hair, because basically what they're doing, doing Umrah yeah. in my heart, remotely, because they, that was the intention. So, and he did that. And as when the Muslims, <clears throat> when the Muslims saw that, they just could not but follow him again. Mm -hmm. They could not, but... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in one of the verses لو أنفقت ما في الأرض جميعا ما ألفت بين قلوبهم ولكن الله ألف بينهم If you spend every wealth, everything on, on earth to bring their hearts together, you wouldn't have succeed. But Allah brought them together. So that's another example where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're reminded all the time, how this group of Muslims came together because the love they had for the Prophet Sallallahu the kind of brought together people from different tribes, different histories, kind of enemies really over decades, if not centuries, some of them, yet became by his grace, you became brothers. That's how what it says. These are all when I was talking earlier about the natural events being underlined by supernatural stratum mm. that's basically what we're talking about here mm -hmm. so anyway so they were unhappy first but when he saw him he's, he's the prophet whether you follow me or not you want to you know come with me do what i do or not i'm i'm just the prophet i have to do what i'm told to do mm. i am I've, I've struck this deal I am now performing my Umar remotely effectively, you know, semi Umar, let's say, and I'm coming back, going back, and they did the same. Uh, the, the reference here the, uh, to the night conquest is usually taken to be the conquest of Khaybar. 
the Jewish fortress. And so that happened about two, three months uh, after this, this particular incident, after Hudaybiyah. And then, of course, the conquest of Mecca itself happened a year later, roughly, a year later. But what you have here, long-term prophecy, completely out of historical context, highly unlikely. Anybody would have seen, yeah, it's possible the Muslims would have grown number, 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 and then at some point they will just invade and kill the Meccans and take, take over. No, it says, everything says, says, well, it's safety. There was no battle there. It's peaceful. So these yeah. are the five uh, miracles that are mentioned in the Quran uh, explicitly. Okay, right. right. Let me stop this now. Right now, but very, very good exposition. Though. I, I think, uh, I think a reasonable person who was not uh, full of uh, animosity or prejudice would uh, think that there were very good grounds to put it mildly uh, for considering the Prophet Muhammad as an authentic prophet of God, even an anti religion person like. Given, given would have you know ac acknowledged there was a prophecy there, mm. and uh, if somebody then you know, but unfortunately reason isn't always the criteria that people yeah, usually, uh, usually is. use. Yeah, well, we just uh, run run after emotions more than reason most of the time. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So now, so those five examples, mm. not examples. I think these are the five I can find and say these are explicitly mentioned miracles yeah, very clear. yeah yeah but there are others which i would call potential miracles in the quran mm. why do i differentiate between them because i want to be as precise as i can mm. and mm. say these are clearly stated as miracles mm. there are others that are not necessarily miracles potentially miracles though right again something often you find conflated when you read about the subject there is no such separation but i think if we want to be more scientific more precise um, we have to, to do that and so well these are clearly mentioned as miracles, but these are not now why something mentioned in the quran is potentially a miracle but not specifically what makes it potentially or a miracle or not well there are two two forms of that um a miracle, something could be miraculous, but not necessarily linked to the prophet directly. Mm. So that would not necessarily count as a miracle of him in the same way we describe what we, you know, the five miracles we spoke about. So an example, maybe one would cite, um, um, you know, the angels who supported the Muslims in their war, oh, yeah. in their battles. Yeah. Well, that's mentioned as as, but that's not that's not something the Prophet mm. alone experienced or he performed. Mm. But it's another aspect of the supernaturality, if you like, mm. in what was going on there. Yeah. That's not something you see. The other kind of incidents or mentions in the Quran that may not be of the only kind we say potentially miraculous is there where the supernatural element isn't clear there so it may or may not be supernatural so to repeat the first reason why something may be only potentially miraculous is because it, it's supernatural but the link to the prophet Salaam is unclear hmm. the second is that when the act or the incident or what's being reported is not necessarily or not may or may not be supernatural okay so what are these? Uh, if we go to the slides. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ah. The most famous splitting of the moon. I forgot about that one. <laughs> Sorry? I forgot about that one, but yeah. I you did, Paul, because I was thinking, why did he not ask me? But here you have it. <laughs> now that's a pretty big one by any standards. Yes. So. The hour drew near and the moon split. And if they see a sign, they turn away and say, 
continuous magic. And they denied and followed their inclinations and every matter will be settled. Beginning of Surah Al-Qamar, Surah number 54. So what, what is it, what, what do we know about this particular uh, event? Now, um, in the Quran, there is mo no more information about it. Looking at it, is this a miracle or not? Now, it mm. sounds miracle. I'm giving it as an example of something that you know, miraculous, but potentially may not be seen as miracle by the Prophet Sallallahu And let me explain why. First of all, the verse describes the moon as split. Um, so split as in it split the moon. It doesn't talk, for instance, about the Prophet Sallallahu splitting the moon. If you look at the, for further information in the books of Hadith, Al-Bukhari cites Anas bin Malik. And according to Anas bin Malik, the Prophet Sallallahu was asked to show a sign to the Meccans, disbelievers. And they pointed at the moon. The moon split in two parts to the point that they were looking so apart, one of them on the top of each of one of Meccans mountains. So they were like quite separate from each other. Um, in Muslim, you find again um, the same explanation, but Muslim actually reports it as something that happened twice. The, the Prophet وسلم, did it twice. You find it also in Termidhi. So in the case uh, of Termidhi, um, he says that when it happened, some people said, you have bewitched us, mm. Muhammad وسلم, And he says that other people retorted and said, but he couldn't have done this to all people, could he? So, in other words, if it was magic, well, it would have worked on some people, not on everybody. So, in here, if these descriptions are taken on face value, then this is a miracle by the Prophet Sallallahu as in he split the moon. Split the moon doesn't mean that the moon remains split. Nobody says that. You have to remember that this verse was revealed at the time and it is in the past tense. So clearly, what is being talked about, a moon that was no more split, it's talking about a phenomenon that happened and ended at the big clear uh, point. I, if I, interrupt, I, mean, I, I don't want to get into a controversy over this. I just I, I just happen to know, uh, looking at Abdul Halim's um, translation, which is a, a, an esteemed English translation, uh, I'll just say what he says about this first without wishing to get into the argument because what you know it's just not going to derail it but um he, he uh this verse verse uh he translates the hour draws near the moon is split and then there's an asterisk looking to a comment beneath he, he says uh halim, Abdul halim one of the signs of the day of judgment the arabic uses the past tense as you just said as if that day the capital d were already here to help the reader slash listener imagine how it will be some traditional commentators hold and presumably he means the you know termidi and muslim you cited uh, that the view that this describes an actual event at the time of the prophet but it clearly refers to the end of the world compare the same expression with reference to the sky in 55:34 in the quran in 84 1. i just mention it because it's in a, a yes thank you Bob. academic translation i'm not in any way trying to push back on what no. you said I was going to deal with that anyway. You anyway, yeah. I was okay. going to deal with it anyway. So, so thank you for raising this point. So, so far, what mm. I've what I've kind of discussed is the verse itself. Uh, by the way, uh, what um, uh, the translator says mm. uh, about the use in Arabic, the use of Arabic uh, of the past, yes, for future events is correct, of course. But right. that because it's used in for Maybe both. It, it doesn't it's not decisive so you can't just say either way because it's in the past because it's past could be past could be future as well yes so exactly. we have to look for something else now the so it, it, the, the according to muslim bukhari and, and others this was an ayah that the prophet sallam performed at the request or demand of the meccans right however there are other stories uh, also in bukhari and muslim and others where 
the event is recounted slightly differently mm. where the prophet just points at the split of the moon he seems to be detached from the event itself but he would look at it and say ishhadu witness this but there is no mention in the in there that he was kind of the if you love the person who did that perform mm. that splitting of the moon oh. and um, so there, there is kind of two separate you can look at them and say well yeah maybe uh, he did not perform it and it's possible that of course he did not perform it if you look at the other set of hadith the view that this is a future event is very old one of the oldest who said that was um, Ibrahim al nadam which I mentioned earlier, he died in 221. Oh, so he did say, the reason, by the way, he said that Nadam was one of the minority who said that the Quran was miraculous only because of its report of the NC. If you remember, we said earlier, the people also believe that because of the literary and you know structure of the Quran, it's miraculous. And Nadam had this view. Uh, that it was mainly because of its reports of the unseen and he is linked to the i you know the concept we discussed earlier called sarfa so turning away or, or allah preventing people from kind of replicating the quran so that uh, is a view that is old known it's it's very small number of people adopted that the number of um, scholars who accept this as you would imagine has gone up with time as we kind of think more scientifically if you like and be more critical of sources and how we look at them however putting aside the issue with the past tense which has been raised in the past and say well this is the past tense but you're right uh, when abdul hay mahmoud says that it can be used for the future however this is the first verse now look at verse number two if that was a sign, first of all, there's no mention there that, that this is going to happen on one particular day or particular uh, kind of time, very close, uh, or, or would involve people who are seeing kind of uh, signs of the end of the world, because there's an ongoing thing happening here. Mm -hmm. and if they see, if they see yeah. a sign, they yeah. turn away and say continuous magic seems to be. A yeah. continuation of the scenario we saw during the life of the Prophet. ﷺ. Then it goes on, and they deny and follow their inclination, and every matter will be settled. Now, there is nothing in the context and the way it's put there to suggest that this verse is any different from how the rejection of the signs of Allah are described in any other verse. So, to me, as I see, as most uh, scholars uh, say, this is an event that has happened at the time and it's miraculous and if, I, if, if i may just embarrass you uh, slightly i just want to remind uh, the viewers that uh, you dr fatui have a phd in astronomy from uh, durham university so uh, it's interesting that um an actual expert astronomer uh, with a phd um I, I mean, i'm not saying there's any issue i'm just saying you're not just a lay person talking about the moon being split you're actually an expert on uh cosmology and uh, astronomy uh, and and that, that's just an interesting uh, yeah. that, you, that you are saying this as well yeah yeah and I think uh, I have to add as well um, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created those um, uh, kind of the moon and the sun obviously they didn't come from Durham that comes from the Quran and uh, I obviously it's a, what what you're, you're absolutely right as a, as a as a scientist as an astronomer yeah. you have to look at it you know, what you study what you're studying from that perspective but the the point that we discussed earlier as a believer uh yeah you have to allow the supernatural and i think and i mentioned this in passing earlier actually this is not about belief as much if you actually are interested in data and observations mm. like scientists do you really can't deny the supernatural it's just you can't there's just so much of it but if you're not busy you know you're busy in your own world you don't want to, but that's a different story. Many scientists are materialists as well which is a philosophical perspective rather than a scientific one so they tend to discount these things skeptically not because science this kind of abstract platonic form <laughs> as if it exists not because they're required to but because of their own 
uh, presumptions about the nature of reality itself. And that's a much bigger issue than just science. It's to do with, you know, the unseen and the supernatural and so on. So it, it, there's a, it's often quite loaded, I think. Yeah, mm. yeah. And, and I think at the end of the day, I have, as you would have noticed, Paul, put it in potential. So this is some people can may or may not. I didn't want to kind of, of this very well. Yeah, yeah. kind of conflate these two. Yep. There's one observation I would like to add here. Mm. So we saw earlier the night journey and the heavenly ascension and the Byzantine victory, those verses, all of them start their respective chapters, surahs. Mm -hmm. This verse does the same. Those three were all miracles, supernatural events. Interesting, interesting observation, yeah. This yeah. is the same, uh, mm -hmm. you know, follows the same pattern. My conclusion, my personal conclusion, I don't really know what exactly happened there, mm -hmm. but I do believe there was a miracle that involves the moon. That's all I can say. I can't go beyond that. It's potential. I did separate it from the rest. Absolutely. So the second example, I try to give an example about what something looks supernatural, but may or may not be linked to the Prophet. So then some would argue maybe it's not even supernatural, but that's you know that's the nature of yeah. of it. Be uh, the next, the second example I'm going to give is is different. It's this is throwing at the throwing of something. Uh, at the disbelievers, and this is the verse concerned. And you, believers, did not kill them, but it was Allah who killed them. And you, now the address to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, did not throw, did not throw, when you threw, but it was Allah who threw that, that He might test the believers with uh, a good test. Now, as you can tell, Paul, the first sentence is making a clear theological point so you believers killed them succeeded but you have to remember that it was me allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately uh, who you know who killed them so i aided you i supported you and you, you were victorious then it makes a point about the prophet it speaks to the prophet not about the killing but have something specific, some specific action mm. that he took, and it applies the same the same logic. Now, it's very it's you know it's reasonable to say uh, what it says in the second sentence. Second, um, you know, is the same that is saying in the first one, which is just making a theological point. So telling the Prophet you threw whatever you threw. It was me who threw it wasn't you there is no supernatural being implied anywhere and that's the end of it that's you know some people may take that view however that however. is not yeah however there's always an however to say because uh, the, uh halim which i come to in a second his academic translation uh, I, 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 for my reading as an amateur it, it clearly implies there was a, a definite miracle from the prophet here yeah there was uh, I think that's that's my uh, the, 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 where I come from on this. The, let me kind of say Sorry, it on the details. Yeah, and then yeah, well, that, uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah. So, so mm. what happened here is that uh, they say, and now we have to turn to sources, uh, extra Quranic sources, to tell us. Ibn Hisham says at the that at the Battle of Badr, the Prophet Sallam threw stones, and that resulted helped in the Muslims defeating the enemy what it, what these stones did exactly we don't know but it was a throw of mm. stones that be referenced here mm. uh, and waqadi mentions uh, dust so again throwing of dust the implication in both of course um, ibn hisham died 183 waqadi i think to to something to 10 20 i don't two or six he got it here so um that's very, these are early reports, but that's, you know, that's their kind of explanation. They don't say it's a miracle, but the implication is there. Yes. The way they, you know, they describe it, uh, it, it implies miracle. Ibn Sa'ad, uh, who's slightly later, died 2.30, in his seerah, uh, gives a slightly different 
version. He says that there was a prisoner of war of Bedr. Hmm. When the Muslims, when he was ransomed and he was to be released, he looked at the Prophet Sallallahu and he told him, I've got a horse. One day I will be mounted on the horse and come and kill you. So the Prophet Sallallahu replied and said, Insha'Allah, it will be me who kill who kill you, kills you. Uh, at, the, at the battle of Uhud, this person came charging at the Prophet Sallallahu mounted on his horse. As he got closer, some Muslim wanted to kill him before he comes too close to the Prophet. The Prophet Sallallahu stopped him and he had a spear that he threw at him. When he threw the spear at him, he killed him. Mm. And that is the story according to, um, to Ibn, Ibn Sa'ad. Now, Ibn Sa'ad's story, depending on how you know, the event exactly happened, may or may not be supernatural. I mean, it could be that he came just so close to the Prophet Sallallahu he threw spear at him and he killed him and that was completely natural. It isn't clear. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any comment made by Bukhari and Muslim uh, on this particular uh, verse. But there, the, if there's one, I'm not aware of it. But mm -hmm. Muslim mentions uh, an event of throwing dust in Hunayn in a, in a different battle. In Hunayn, in a different battle. Again, the the Prophet would not have thrown dust, think, dust thinking that dust would kill the enemy. It, it, the implication, it must have been something uh, miraculous that he did. But for the reasons I mentioned here, it is very difficult to tell um, on those on the base of information there's, it's not conclusive however for me in my point of view the fact the separation of the act of the prophet sallam, and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressing him directly about it does imply to me that the possibility uh, that this was or it, it makes it likely that this was actually miraculous and if i could just uh, read from abdul halim uh, yes, respected academic translation uh, published by oxford university press uh, he, he has this verse, it was not you who killed them, addressing the prophet, but God. Where, and when you, prophet, threw sand at them, now he has those words, sand at them in parenthesis. Uh, and then there's a comment at the bottom, uh, before the battle, the prophet prayed and threw a handful of sand at the enemy as a symbol of their being defeated. And then he continues, sand at them. It was not your throw that defeated them, but God's to do the believers a favor. God is all seeing and all knowing. Um, so uh, th that is what you get and God will weaken the disbelievers designs. So that, that sounds very mir miraculous uh, in, in the way that he interprets uh, yeah. the passage. And there is there, there are several parenth parenthetical comments, uh, sand at them and the words prophet and that defeated them. These are obviously explanatory uh, yeah. additions to help to clarify the very concise Arabic. So in English, Correct. you need to expand it a bit so we can understand it better. Correct. And I think it, it, it's completely, yeah, completely justified in my view, uh, based on the information we have, the context of the verse. Um, to me, it does very much sound that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is highlighting something supernatural. Okay. Okay. So um, now we've been talking about the Quran and we spoke about two kind of kinds of um, miracles, if you like, those mm. that are clear and specific, five of them, and there are others that I give two examples of that are potential. So, mm. just to separate these two. If that is the case, why do people say the Quran does not confirm that the Prophet performed miracles? So, what they do, they use two approaches, and I'm they don't say it this way, by the way, this is my analysis, so just to make, it, to make it clear. So what they do, they use argument from silence. That's one approach. Say, well, the Quran does not mention anything there. Mm -hmm. And because it doesn't mention, they did not happen. The second approach is the Quran's supposed denial that they, they did that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that he performed miracles. And then 
I think we go back, you know, as, as early as um, we can in our sources. And of course, you can find a claim by some uh, non-Muslims that the Prophet did not perform miracles. That's, that's well known. So what I'm going to deal with now, uh, Paul, is those two claims that the Quran was silent. Now, it wasn't silent, it isn't silent, but I'm going to use some of those kind of some verses to show what the Quran is in silent. The difference between this and what I did earlier, I am now quoting verses that do not talk about specific miracles but they talk about miracles in general terms so just to make this clear earlier we discussed specific events incidents now we're going to talk about quote some verses that talk about miracles in general yeah okay so let's let's go to the slides oh sorry yeah okay Um, <laughs> um, you you quoted somebody earlier. Yes, and I have a quote as well. Yeah, yeah there's there are other verses that the claim our claim to also say the similar thing. I didn't quote them. Yes, yeah. well, let's double up on ourselves then. Mm. Here's another. One. Mm. Oh, yeah. So this is from somebody um, who's a professor uh, at uh, Tendale Seminary, Toronto, and uh, he's the author of a book called. Uh, this is taken from, um, as you say, a book called uh, The Quran and Encyclopedia, and he's written uh, the uh, entry for Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, this professor also wrote a book called Getting Jesus Right, the subtitle of which, How Muslims Get Jesus and Islam Wrong. And he wrote it with Craig Evans, whom I'm pretty sure you know of. Okay, and this is the quote. Uh -huh. The traditional picture of Muhammad as a miracle worker hardly, hardly rises from explicit teachings in the Quran. The Islamic scripture restricts the miraculous element in Muhammad's life to his supernatural reception of divine revelation. 2950, which you quoted earlier, um, yep. Paul implies that Muhammad's task is to be a warner, not a miracle worker. Thus, the true miracle in Islam is the Quran, a dogma which has led some Muslim apologists to construct even mathematical arguments for its divine origin. The famous accounts of the Prophet's miracles have little support in actual Quranic material. For example, the description of the famous night journey and subsequent mi'raj could never be drawn from the actual words in surah 17. <laughs> so what this is in is exactly is what i call it's um it's a two-step strategy what are these two steps that's a very popular evangelical approach to islam and the quran so they start first by confirming that the quran does not mention anything miraculous about the prophet once they've done that, the next step is to discredit the Quran itself. If they don't do that, if they only say the Quran is um, uh, does not deny the miracles of the Prophet or confirms them, but we don't believe the Quran is of divine origin, they would still have a problem they don't know how to live with. Because, yes, they don't believe in the Quran, but then how do you explain what Muhammad وسلم, did? which the Quran says he did, and that would be a problem. So the easiest thing to do, well, claim that the Quran doesn't say anything about the Prophet or even denies that the Prophet had miracles. And then after that, let's move to the next stage and then dismiss the Quran itself. Mm -hmm. And there are seven claims in this particular quote uh, put on screen here. So first, miracle hardly rises. Now, I want viewers hopefully can remember what we've been seeing discussing so far and look at the wording of this quote so it's hardly arises from explicit teaching in the quran the Islam restricts the miraculous element to only receiving the quran not true 
this is the verse you mentioned earlier, which we can kind of go over later. So the Quran is the only true miracle in Islam. Now we have performed the first step of the strategy. Let's move on to the next. Now, those Muslims have constructed even mathematical arguments when, in fact, obviously, the Quran is not divine. It has little support. Those miracles have little support in actual Quranic material. And then, which is kind of quite misleading, correct, but misleading statement, the fact that the details of these events, uh, miracles, come from extra-Quranic sources, but that has nothing to do with whether they are miracles or not. The description of these events in the Quran is miracles. They are miracles. The fact that the details have come from elsewhere, other sources, is irrelevant. So he's saying effectively, because we don't have that much uh, details in the Quran, then uh, we have effectively uh, to, to dismiss it. And I think that's just, that's flawed methodologically. I don't think that's good methodology. No, I just, can I just, can I just, I mean, maybe you're going to say this, but I, I, is it interesting you highlighted some of these in red? Hardly arises and little support. I just was struck by those two phrases. I was struck by, by their ambiguity. Hardly arises is not equivalent to say never arises, and little support is not equivalent to saying no support. So one could interpret his statement to saying, well, there actually are statements but they're, they're marginal, they're not significant, or whatever, however he wants to characterize them. I don't know how miraculous statements can be um, marginal, but they're not unequivocal, I, I, I read that, because he could have used much clearer language, like never arises, does not arise, and or no support, or are, are completely absent of any support. He doesn't say that. So there's, a, there's an ambiguity there, which kind of almost saying never, but not actually saying never. And the reason I actually don't like this because it leaves the reader, at least me anyway, confused as to what he's actually stating and claiming about the Quran. He's not being unequivocal and clear 100% in his rejection, but that is the implication of what he's saying clearly, but it's not absolutely certain so there's an ambiguity in his statement which i think he's kind of trying to cover himself a bit which i actually don't like I, this is that contrast with you dr david too in your uh pristine clarity of thought your clarity of exposition and your clarity of scholarly analysis is is one of the hallmarks i would suggest of your uh scholarly ethos your methodology but for this scholar james a beverly it's not uh, actually, at least if this paragraph represents his methodology, it's fudging a bit, it's ambiguous, it's fuzzy, and I don't like that because, uh, and it's, but it's, it's still denying it ish, but not with the clarity that you would expect a scholar perhaps to bring to this issue. So I'm not satisfied linguistically with what he's doing, let alone agreeing with him in his substance. Yeah, yeah, I think I completely, completely agree with you, Paul. Yes. Uh, and I just, uh, you know, um, wanted to quote him as an example, of course. Uh, there are many, many others uh, out there who would use this kind of same wordings and make same claims. So what I'm going to do now, right? I have chosen three verses, no more, to show that the Quran is not silent on the miracles of the Prophet as in, mm -hmm. in general terms, yeah, not sure. the ones that we've already studied. Mm -hmm. We've done that. So, okay. So let's start with one of them. And they swear by Allah their strongest oath that if a sign came to them, they would surely believe in it. Say the signs are only with Allah, but he does not make you perceive that. For even if they came, they would not believe. Now, this is actually uh, very similar, I think, to 2950 uh, that was quoted earlier by Beverly. Uh, it says, um, I've got it here as it happened. It says, uh, but they say, why are not signs sent down to him from his Lord? Say the signs are only with Allah and I'm only a clear warner. So that's what kind of close wordings here. What's happening here? So we have a verse in, in which 
Allah, the Prophet, the, Allah is instructing the Prophet to remind people, those who are challenging him, that any sign is ultimately from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. It's not that this is something that he can do as in if when he wants. Mm -hmm. So uh, this and this statement is not um, a, a dismissal no. of the of the that the fact that the Prophet Sallam had miracles and and it's a, and, and also it's a statement to, uh, that applies and this is very important that applies to every prophet right. let me put this differently that jesus would have said that and he must have said it at some point moses would have done that this is not to say that this is only the prophet وسلم, that was instructed to say this yeah. because he did not have miracles the the, the verse does not does not say that but let me show you why the use of this one verse on its own in separation from other verses is misleading to say the least i'm gonna now quote a verse from the same chapter note that this is an am surah 6 And when a sign comes to them, they say, we will never believe until we are given like that which was given to the messengers of Allah. Mm. Allah knows best where he places his message. Now, if someone would argue that the first verse is talking about the Prophet وسلم, they have to be fair and argue the second talks about him as well. Mm -hmm. This is the same group of people arguing in both um, verses. The verses happen to come from the same chapter, from the same surah. This is what I call dishonest demands for miracles. The, 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 those disbelievers were not asking for miracles because they genuinely wanted a miracle that would turn them from non-Muslims into Muslims, etc. The fact is, if he gives them something, they would say, I mean, the Jews are reported to have asked Moses to make them see Allah, right? This is exactly the same context, similar thing. Because he would say, I sp he speaks to me. Well, say, well let, let us see them. They wanted to see. So he told them, um, I have this miracle, but they wanted also to experience something similar so that verse uh, does not deny so they say so it's not silent it, if anything this the second verse does confirm that signs did come but they did not believe in them right there's another verse i would put in my notes here but not on the slide and um, they said again that similar argument why was this quran not sent down on a great man from one of the two cities well, are we to take this to mean that the Quran was not sent down? Well, if you follow the same logic, there was no Quran because clearly they are doubting the fact they want the Quran similar to what Muhammad had. Mm -hmm. And also, also that's interesting, isn't it, Paul? It takes me back to the original point. Why did you? Why did they not try to make up make up one? Mm -hmm. They couldn't. So, this is what this this is one set of verses i'm going to start another two examples on this now this is what i call miracles witnessed now look at this verse hmm. how shall allah guide the people who disbelieved after their belief and they witnessed that the messenger is true and clear proofs had come to them wow. and allah does not guide the wrongdoing now let me remind you what we're doing here paul i'm talking about verses that address miracles in general terms mm -hmm. this is not even in the singular it's in the plural clear proofs bayinat clear proofs came to them so this is again talking about what happened at the time of the prophet sallallahu it's really self-explanatory here 
Now, the third verse is something I quoted earlier. The hour drew near and the moon split and if they see a sign, they turn away and say continuous magic and they denied and fall there. The, the reason I quoted this, now obviously this is kind of contingent on accepting that what we're talking here about, um, um, talking about the time of the Prophet not yeah. uh, nearing the, you know, the day of judgment. And what you look at that is that if they see a sign, they turn away and say, continuous magic, continuous. Oops. It's the word continuous that, that I'm looking at here. So they saw something new, that will say a sign is a singular, but when they saw that one new thing, their reaction was, this is similar to something we saw earlier. Mm, mm. This has been ongoing for some time now. What does this suggest? If you accept that the verse is talking about something that happened at the time of the prophet, so it's contingent on that, admittedly, then it is. it can only mean that the people who are arguing here had been seeing magic, what they called magic, or signs, multiple signs over a period of time, continuous, they were happening all the time. These are the three verses that I wanted to cite as talking um, to show that the Quran is not silent in general terms. It does actually mention miracles. Mm -hmm. Now, moving on to the denial. Now, this is very, you know, a verse that is often quoted. Mm -hmm quoted quite a lot and they say we will not believe until you make a spring to gush forth from the earth for us or you have garden of palm trees and grapes and make rivers gush forth abundantly therein or you make the heaven fall upon us as you have claimed in the fragments or you bring Allah and the angels before us or you have a house of gold or you ascend into heaven and even then we would not believe in your ascension until you bring down to us a book we may read. Say, instructing the prophet, exalted is my Lord, was I ever but a human messenger? And claimants jump at the reply of the prophet and say, well, why would he say that if he had miracles? Why would he apply that? Okay. Let me explain what's going on here. The, this argument is based on misunderstanding of the words of the Prophet ﷺ, itself based on misunderstanding miracles. Now, Muslim scholars have taken the view that the, the, the argument that this shows that the Prophet did not have miracles is, it, it is wrong because this is about specifics. So they say, well, yeah. disbelievers are not, they're not supposed to ask for specific miracles. Now, this is a good point, but I don't think it's the complete picture here. Let me, let me explain. Miracles, the main point that the disbelievers are missing here, miracles are not an on-demand service. Exactly. Miracles are not there to be called upon if and whenever a prophet would want a miracle. So, exactly. so let me let me kind of quote another verse, which I haven't put it on this, I haven't put on this slide. And and if it and it was not for a messenger to come with a sign except by, by permission of Allah, for every term is a degree. This is not talking about the Prophet, it's talking in general terms. Any messengers. If you go back to the Quran and you um, check the two verses, long verses, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the miracles of Jesus, the most impressive miracles of Jesus. In one of them, 349, he says, by Allah's permission. So when he mentions the, 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 the miracles, he says, by Allah's permission. And in 5110, uh, 5, he says, by my permission. 
So when mentioning those most impressive miracles, the, the fact that uh, they were, by Allah's permission, is stressed. Now, that's, that's the only and the main point here. Miracles were not on demand. Let me kind of... Uh, yeah, can, can I just, before you can, I just, I, I just reinforce that point, if I may, from the, uh, the New Testament, uh, of all places. Um, uh, there's a great speech attributed, uh, I stress attributed, to Peter in the book of Acts. This is after Jesus' ascension and the, uh, the apostles uh, in Jerusalem. And he's, he's telling the, the, the Israelites, Peter, the prince of the apostles, uh, who Jesus is. Uh, and he doesn't yeah. mention, of course, that Jesus is God or anything like that at all. But he, doesn't, he makes this interesting statement, which is directly perhaps relevant to what you've just said. Acts 2.22, I'm reading from the NRSV. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders and signs that God did through him among you as you yourselves know now the significance of that is that peter's just calling jesus a man if he was really god or divine he said oh jesus was god he doesn't say that so that's a really interesting claim a statement he's making but also that the the miraculous events that the signs and the wonders the healings the raisings of the dead the the and so on that are attributed to jesus in the gospels that we have were that God did those through him. They, they, they weren't on tap, if you like, as you put it, uh, from the prophet's own power. He didn't intrinsically have that power. Uh, like you say that, you know, he was, uh, well, like the Quran says, um, was I ever but a human messenger? And I think that really dovetails nicely with who Jesus was. But nevertheless, he, he did many miracles, but by the power of God. And that's the very point that the Quran makes, of course, in correcting perhaps many Christians misconception about the nature and ministry of Jesus. So it's ironic that the New Testament in places itself endorses in, in a way, if I can put it like that, what the Quran is saying uh, over against the often repeated claim that Jesus being divine had these powers in his own being, his own nature. Even the Bible refutes that in Acts 2.22, a remarkable verse. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. Absolutely. And, um, I'm going to make a kind of another point related to what we're talking about, a subtle point actually in verses that talk about Moses, Sayyidina Musa. And what's interesting about that, if you look at the verses that talk about when uh, Sayyidina Musa cast his staff, you know, when he confronted oh, yeah. the magicians, now it says that Moses cast his staff and then etc. Et he won the battle. But there is one particular verse in which kind of explains what actually happens. And that wording there is slightly different. And that is that, and we inspired Moses, cast your staff, in other words. Now remember, what this, what this, what I'm trying to say here is that the, the, the throwing of the cast was an instruction, instruction by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Moses to do that. Now, mm -hmm. if you go and check when Sayyidina Moses, um, you know, the kind of um, created springs for the Israelites, in both cases, it comes as an instruction. <inaudible> Strike with your, the stone with your staff, in both cases. Mm. When it says the parting of the sea against a strike, the sea with your staff mm. why is this important because it is really naive to think that as a lot of people probably have this kind of misconception which is where the argument against the prophet Salam comes from they think moses had a staff that was miraculous and he was going about doing whatever he wanted whenever he liked like a character out of harry potter shall we say exactly with exactly magic wand a wizard yeah, exactly. And uh, that wasn't the case. In fact, Moses had to escape at night with the Israelites from Egypt. He mm. had to. He mm. couldn't just, it wasn't this childish game of him having. With Jesus, well, had he not protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he would have been killed. That's why he repeats more than once that 
when he came, when Jesus brought miracles to the Israelites, they wanted to kill him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved him. Mm -hmm. The wording of saving him from the crucifixion is always attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is never mentioned as a miracle by Jesus. Jesus wasn't going, going about in Palestine just causing havoc with his miracles. It, it just wasn't like that. It never happened. So what they do? But you say that, but later Christian apocryphal literature, uh, like the Proto-Evangelium of James, which I'm not saying is, uh, yeah. it's not part of the Jewish, uh, the Christian yeah. Bible now, did attribute these kinds of childish, uh, miraculous powers to uh, Jesus, uh, the child. But the earlier uh, uh, um, material that w we're quoting from doesn't actually. So it, it, it's, it's an idea that did come in time in the in some Christian communities, but uh, I'm not in any way suggesting that was yeah. historical. But I, I, might, I might add to that, Paul. It's not only that they took it to that you know kind of bigger extent and dimension and made it something at will and on demand, mm. but even childish takes a different meaning in the case you mentioned because that was actually Jesus behaving in a childish way. Yes. Actually, if you remember, he would get angry as another kid, yes. another kid, and it would cause him to fall from the yes. you know top of the house and get killed. And, and the whole thing is quite obviously, you know, clearly made up later. Uh, yes. So, so this image uh, about the prophet, the arguments coming there against the uh, miracles of the prophet are influenced partly by this wrong image of other prophets uh, mentioned in the Bible. Um, in the New Testament, whereby uh, they had miracles, but the, the miracles aren't things that they were performed on demand. They were they followed the same, same exact laws, if you like, and restrictions. And the, a prophet is not somebody who can do anything and everything. If we say that, and anybody says that, there would be no difference between a prophet and Allah. Simple. Or, or a prophet and a wizard, uh, a worker of magic. And of course, that is explicitly dis disallowed and disavowed right. in Islam, right. uh, as, as it is in the Bible, I mean, the, the, in, the, um, in the Torah, in the Levitical laws. Yeah. yeah. If we go back to the slide, the same slide. Oh, yes. Yeah, I want just to highlight something here that um, I don't think it's been probably mentioned before, but let me see. Now, we have five challenges set. And this is the sixth, that you ascend into heaven. For some reason, only this one particular challenge is followed by a confirmation that even if you ascend into heaven, we still won't believe you until you bring a book to us. Yes. I guess... Once the observation is made, the answer should be pretty clear. Those who made this argument were aware of the heavenly ascension. They were aware of the miracle of Mi'raj. The only miracle that they said, if you were to perform it, we would still want another piece of evidence from you that you did it. None of the earlier ones were followed by that. But that one particular miracle is mentioned by another challenge, mm. followed by another challenge. Okay, let me just stop the uh, slide now and talk about slightly different thing. Um, did I stop it or not? I think I saw. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, Muslims. Um, they are Muslim. The Westerners, in general, obviously don't believe in the Quran, and all of them can say anybody who doesn't well, believe in the Quran. Have ever even heard of the Quran or read the Quran? Right. To, to to disbelieve in it is is just saying, well, we understand and we've seen it and heard it, and we don't believe it. I, I think that's probably not the case with ninety nine percent of Westerners. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they've never encountered the Quran, so they're not disbelieving it. They're simply ignorant of it. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And obviously, they, they, you know, they kind of argue that the Quran is silent on the miracles of the Prophet and denies yeah. the miracles of the Prophet, as I explained. But there's a small minority of Muslims who also deny that the, the, the Quran mentions any miracles of the Prophet. So why do they do that? 
I mean, we've, we've already discussed things. Mm -hmm. Well, one, one driver for that is kind of general skepticism of the supernatural. Mm -hmm. I mean, we see, we saw this with a number of people, say, Ahmad Khan in the 19th century in India, uh, mm -hmm. Muhammad Abdu in Egypt. Uh, had also an element of that, some of his followers, and there are people, you know, with the kind of, let's say, an element of scientism um, and, uh, you know, growing and, and also people can kind of linking this state, the miserable state of the Muslim nation to their to beliefs like these, unfairly, as if it's the belief in the miracles that actually stop people from doing the proper jobs and getting an education. Poverty, yeah, it's, it's slightly a random connection, yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's that's one what is it? The other thing, the reason is the lack of details uh, in the Quran. Um, now, we already saw that the Quran it just mentions things very briefly, mm -hmm. but that's the style of mm -hmm. the Quran. The, mm -hmm. the Quran, if you look at the Quran, if you read it, if it's talking, if it's making a theological point, um, recounting historical event, uh, talking about Mir miracle it's it's succinct and brief and yes. to the point yeah. it did, it's not like uh, oh, it's so detailed when it talks history and then suddenly it becomes brief silent short when it comes to miracles well that's not the case it is a throughout this is it, the style throughout if you're gonna make this argument that details don't exist in the quran on this well, you're going to end up rejecting much of the Quran, unfortunately, if that's actually the argument you're going to make. You have to accept that the Quran is the Quran, the way it stands, and it is actually brief. Now, the problem here is that most of the details of these miracles come from Hadith. These people, not all of them, a lot of them reject Hadith, as in, in general, reject everything. And then you have another problem now because they uh, they don't believe in hadith and then we end up with a quranic quranist approach so people who believe it's only the quran i mean first of all I mean, the main problem i have with that i cannot think conceive of a book that's partly historical um, and talks about um, culture and local circumstances that can be studied without external sources of information. I, just, I can't, can't conceive what that is like. How do you actually take a book, part of it, parts of which, of which talks about the history of the area, the, the, the beliefs of the communities who live there, how they, their customs, um, to, all of that. How, you, how do you claim that you actually can read that book without the help of other external sources? But let me take this even one step further. I'm an Arab and I read the Quran as in my mother language. But even an Arab would need uh, to consult uh, Arabic lexicons and check and see what possible meanings there are for certain words. And when I started to read the Quran, or anybody starts to read the Quran at any point, and they are native Arabs, they aren't starting of no information other than the Quran. They started starting with their understanding of at least how Arabic works and what certain words in Arabic meant. So it's a false, absurd, a trivial argument to say that we actually can approach the Quran with no reference uh, and the, the Quran itself, I think, assumes uh, some knowledge on its readers or listeners of biblical stories, uh, whether it be uh, the life of Jesus or Moses and so on. And uh, you know, it, it retells the story, sometimes correcting them. Um, uh, I mean, we won't go into the details, but it's very well known for, you know, reducing the exaggerated claims, for example, about the nature of the flood or the numbers of people that left uh, Egypt on the Exodus. You've mentioned this before. Uh, and, and so on and so on. So it's interacting in a way, I mean, this is kind of a more Western perspective, I guess, with the biblical material, um, uh, uh, but the, the audience is, is assumed to have some knowledge of this. It's not like they're blank canvases, they've never heard of Jesus before or Moses. They, 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 they are reminding them the, the truth about those stories from the ultimate source, which is God himself, uh, sometimes in a critical uh, interaction with the Jewish 
scriptures or the Christian sources. So it is part of that milieu of the of that yeah. interreligious world. And so you're right; it's very much uh, within a wider context of understanding and meaning, rather than just isolated uh, from the world. And I think I would also kind of further expand on that, Paul. It, it does say, it implies, presumes knowledge that exists out there, but also yeah. some of what, say, what it says, it kind of uh, makes you seek more knowledge outside mm. the Quran mm. in order to understand it, because it gives you some certain stories, etc. And then you say, well, I don't know what that is. I have to go and, and do my what well, you cannot use it on its own. So a Quranist approach, in my view, it just doesn't make any sense, basically. Yeah. And, and I, I, I personally can't make sense of it. So um, and I wanted also to cite another example about this particular issue, the brevity of the Quran and how uh, kind of the uh, brevity of, of the Quran, um, how brief it is and how succinct and the fact that it lacks uh, details at times. So we have one verse. Now, the, the, the Hijra, the migration of the Prophet Sallallahu is such a major critical event. Everybody agrees on that, Muslim and Muslim. This particular verse, this particular event is actually mentioned in the Quran in one single verse. Mm. Directly, I mean, just directly. And the event, it, the, the ayah itself, uh, talks about when the Prophet Sallallahu and Abu Bakr were in the cave. So they had already left Mecca, uh, you know, escaping the disbelievers who'd come after them. Mm. Uh, and they had gone into Ghartaw, so um, to, to hide there. I'm going to read the verse first. The, the, this is kind of the, the Prophet realizing that Abu Bakr was worried, effectively. He was concerned there after. So he wanted to reassure him. Do not grieve. Indeed, Allah is with us. That end of quote. And Allah sent down his tranquility upon, upon him. That's the Prophet. And supported him with hosts you did not see. Hosts you did not see. Now, why is this particularly interesting? First of all, it's a brief. A brief even about a massive event. Again, mm -hmm. nobody can argue say, well, the Prophet ﷺ did not migrate because there's only just one verb, uh, the one verse there. So that's no argument. Second, and that's where it takes us back to the subject. But let me mention something actually in passing here about the manners of the Prophet, ﷺ, the character of the Prophet. ﷺ. He was a human being. So he must have must have also felt the pressure of the circumstances. He just left his family, left everybody. He was fleeing Mecca and those disbelievers. And they, and he knew they were after him. In fact, he left uh, Ali bin Abi Talib in his, um, in his bed. And he left. So, so he was aware. However, when he noticed that Abu Bakr was concerned, worried, he actually turned to him to reassure him. That is an act of leadership. That's what a leader does. A leader... At, at, at times like this, looks at those whom they lead, he or she leads, and reassure them, and make sure that they are, they are given what they need. And the Prophet ﷺ was the source of comfort for Sayyidina Abu Bakr. Now, let's move on to what happened after. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes this comment, and Allah sent down his tranquility upon him. What is interesting, the ayah started talking about two. Thania ithnain, the second of two. In Humafilgar, when they are in the cave. And then talks about what he says, La tahzan, and he says to his companion, do not agree. But then it stops that kind of talking about two to talk about one. The Prophet in that small group of two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down his tranquility upon the Prophet and supported him with hosts you did not see, meaning something miraculous happened, something supernatural, that's what it means. Now, in that small, tight kind of community of two, group of two, the Prophet ﷺ experienced something Abu Bakr was not aware of, mm. was not aware of. He was with him, nobody else there. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the wording of the ayah, 
suggest that this is something talking about the Prophet alone. What I'm trying to get to is what I mentioned earlier and what I call the spiritual life of the Prophet mm -hmm. which we often forget and we think because we've got the history we've got we forget that he wasn't he wasn't only the history we knew about him we know about him he was a lot more than that his history with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't only what was reported to us he had an ongoing close uh, relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is an example of what I'm talking about here Abu Bakr was with him, next to him, hiding with him. Yet, the experience is described as something that happened to the Prophet mm -hmm. Moving on to the sources that explain this event, uh, in, in Hadith, we find references to a spider who made, uh, made a web at the entrance of the cave. So when the Meccans, the chasing Meccans, came after the Prophet so the web and they said well clearly nobody is in the in the cave otherwise um the you know there they wouldn't have been a web it would have taken some time uh, to make that web ibn sa'ad adds another uh, and he says and and two wild pigeons uh nested there so there was also a nest there now we don't know the word um uh, the word used in the ayah is junood hosts we don't know what that is, but at times it's used for miracles, uh, sorry, um, angels, but could be used for anything else. So we don't know, but the implication, the clear implication, something supernatural took place. Now, the fact we don't have the details of what happened, and then the details are given in hadith, does not, or sira, does not mean that the supernatural does not happen. It did happen. It's just where we don't have the details in the Quran itself. Um, now another I mentioned something example I mentioned earlier when when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions more than one place that in battles the Muslims experience support from angels again it's a natural event the battle itself but it was something happening at the same time my point is that whatever miracles we can find and study they're not going to be the whole story even if there were reports that are wrong, false, um, fabricated, the reality is that the Prophet ﷺ, his life was permeated by miracles, by the supernatural. He was in direct contact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time. I can find, I can pick so many verses. And I've given an example here of the migration, for instance, when they were in the cave. And I can pick so many other verses and analyze them in, in the same way and show how there was something spiritual taking place in the midst of a natural event, completely natural event. And we have to remember that when we think about the Prophet So, uh, the point is that miracles, there are things that are visible, were seen, reported, and there are things that happened we don't know nothing about. So, to go back a little bit, where does this then claim of uh, silence of the Quran on the miracles of the Prophet or denial, it really comes from um, a misreading first and part reading the Quran. So mm -hmm. they take one verse and say, well, that, what, that's what the Quran says. No, that has to be understood in the context of other verses as well. You can't only take, take that. And So for instance, the Quran says, La ikrah din. there's no compulsion in religion. Nobody can and should pick one verse in which it talks about the fighting, fighting of Muslims uh, against the disbelievers and say, well, here we go, Islam actually spread by sword. No, nobody falls forward because if you want to talk about the Quran, you may say this ayah says so if you want, but the Quran itself is all of its verses. So if you put them together, I cannot see any reasonable person, fair-minded person who can say the Quran does not confirm the prophet, the miracles of the prophet Now, let's go back to the slides. Um, okay. I want to say a few things about hadith as well. Now, mm -hmm. let's look at Bukhari and Muslim in particular because these are the main two sources, of course. And I'm gonna just list some of the uh, miracles mentioned 
very famous one. So the Prophet Sallallahu Muslims at times were short of water for ablution or for drinking. And the Prophet Sallallahu there are a number of different um, stories, is said to have put his hand in a container and then the water started flowing um, from his hand, his fingers, and then people had enough for ablution and enough to drink. So that's one um, miracle. The other multiplication of food, again, there are certain incidents where Muslims were short of food, uh, and then uh, he helped uh, with uh, creating or turning that little food into something that was more than sufficient for uh, for all those available. A weeping trunk, um, this is the tr uh, tree trunk. Um, the Prophet used to stand next to um, a tree when he would speak to Muslims in Medina. And then one day he was told, why don't we build a pulpit for you there? So you can speak to us from there. And then uh, when he when it was built and he went to talk to Muslims there, those present heard the tree weep missing the Prophet Sallallahu who used to stand next to it. Mm -hmm. That's also, and then uh, the story goes, he went to the tree trunk and embraced it and it's calmed down. It's went silent. Um, again, another event, um, this is mentioned um, by Bukhari, but not Muslim. So uh, when the prophet neared his death uh, he spoke to fatima one day he confided confided in her something and um, he spoke to her aisha was present but didn't hear what he said to um, to say the fatima and uh, she cried fatima cried when he saw that she cried he called her again and he again told her something in secret this time she laughed when aisha asked her what afterwards, what did he say to her? She wouldn't tell. But then after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, she told Aisha and she said, when he first spoke to me, he told me that his death was near. So I cried. <laughs> and then um, he called me again to tell me that, but you're gonna be the first of my family to follow me. So I laughed. And um, she died about two months after the Prophet said Fatima. She was very young, I think 29 years old. Um, now, this is another event where the Negus, Negus of Abyssinia, of course, is the king who um, supported Muslims when they first migrated um, to Abyssinia. And uh, the, we are told in, the, in our hadith sources, including Bukhari and Muslim, that one day the Prophet ﷺ told the Muslims that the niggas uh, died on the same day and he performed the prayer of the dead on him, uh, the funeral prayer. And again, that's a miracle because the, the Prophet could not have known that Abyssinia is further, very far from where he lived. So that's another miracle that's mentioned in the sources. Uh, there's another one. Uh, this is mentioned, I think, in, in Muslim and um, uh, sorry, in Bukhari. And it, it, the story goes that the Prophet Sallallahu uh, went on the Mount of Uhud. Uh, he had with him the uh, Umar and Uthman uh, and Abu Bakr. And as they were on the mountain, the mountain shook. And as a result, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu said, Uhud, be firm, as in don't shake. And mm. uh, the wording goes uh, that the exact wording is that uh, there are on you um, a prophet, a truthful person, and two martyrs. And what we are, so he spoke to Uhud calm it down and then he also for kind of spoke about the uh, the how uh, Omar and Uthman will both be martyred killed by 
uh, enemies uh, in the future. Uh, there's a beautiful uh, saying as well of uh, the Prophet about Uhud. He says, Uhud, Jabalun, 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 Nuhibu, wa Yuhibuna. Uhud is a mountain that we love and it loves us. Hmm. It just so, so I find it extremely beautiful. Um, and those who think that this is impossible, supernatural, they need to go out more. <laughs> okay, so um, where are we now? Right, and there are other scattered miracles uh, elsewhere. And then um, if I just say a quick thing about other sources of hadith, Malik, who died in 179, uh, mentions three miracles. Mm. Uh, multiplication of water uh, and food, um, multiplication of water and food, both of them, uh, water for drinking and water for ablution. Um, Ibn Abu Shayba, uh, who died two, three, five, uh, he has a huge musannaf that has about 40,000 hadith. He has a lot of, um, you know, uh, miracles, stories of miracles. Uh, you find the same in uh, Musannaf Abdul Razak, who died to 11. Uh, who say you find the same in, uh, in, in, in Musnad Ahmed, Ahmed bin Hanbal. And, and, and I'm not, you know, there isn't, as I said earlier, there's much benefit to kind of repeat what they say. People can go consult them. Uh, mm -hmm. But what I would say is that you find much less in Bukhari and Muslim, not least because they are smaller uh, compilations. And obviously, um, they are very selective, uh, mm -hmm. both of them, in what they reported um, at the time. Um, right, uh, there are what also is not worth mentioning over time. This kind of miracles of the Prophet developed into a, a, a genre in its own right. Mm -hmm. So, you have, you have books published called The Signs of Prophethood uh, by people like Al Asbahani in, in, four, in the middle of uh, the five, fifth century, Al Bayhaqi again at the time. The oldest book that I have come across that is kind of focused on this issue is by somebody called, not known, not much known, it's called Ibn Rabbin. Ibn Rabbin died towards the middle uh, of the third century, so at the same time as Bukhari and Muslim. And he authored a book called ad din wa dawla Religion and the State. And I think the title seems to have come from the fact that supposedly he actually co-authored it with the Abbasid uh, Khalifa, al uh, Mutawakkil al Allah. I don't know how possible that is, but that's effectively what they say. But the, as a, as a as a book on the miracles of the Prophet, it is very old. It goes to the middle of the the centuries. So obviously, um, the point here is that there is no doubt in my view that some of these narratives must be inaccurate, if not inauthentic, altogether incorrect. But that's not, that's what happens with whenever you write history, uh, over time, people add, change, um, mm. you know, deliberately or unwittingly, whatever. Uh, you gave an example of how later uh, Gospels uh, developed the stories that were not in the earlier Gospels. And that's, that's just normal. So it doesn't really tell us much other than it tells us something about human beings, which we all should know. So I've come now to the conclusion, and I want just to sum up everything, and I hope it hasn't been too long there. So, the Quran is unambiguous in confirming that the Prophet ﷺ performed miracles. It mention, mentions specific miracles, and it talks about miracles he performed in general terms without specifying them. Hadith sources, as well as actually Sira sources, even books of Creed, confirm that this is the case. Yeah. So, where are we now? If we go back to that old spectrum of belief, disbelief I started with in the miracles of the Prophet in my view, I don't think any reasonable Muslim can be anywhere other than accepting, obviously, the, the Quran and accepting that the Prophet Muhammad um, performed a lot of miracles, but also what I hope to have been able to convey here 
at least to explain clearly that we really need to be careful when you think of the spiritual, what I call the spiritual life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and not mm -hmm. to think about him in, in, in just worldly terms, one thing. Second, don't ever, it's presumptuous, it really is arrogant to think that I know what he went through, what he experienced with Allah, how many mm -hmm. dreams, visionary dreams he had because I know of two or three in the Quran. This is just absurd. It doesn't make sense. And every time you look at any verse, you can choose so many verses and sh give an example. I tried, hopefully I I managed to do uh, some of those. Um, just to finish on one point, everything we talked about here is history. We spoke about history. Uh, miracles of the Prophet that happened in the past at some point during his life. I'm going to mention something quickly because it's a completely different subject, but it's linked. So the Prophet has is reported in all authentic uh, sources. He said, Whoever sees me in a dream, or then he has seen me true in truly in truth. There are reports about the Prophet performing miracles after he died, appearing to people in dreams, appearing to people, some say, you know, in, in wakefulness, not only in dreams. And these are miracles reported to the Prophet. Now, it might be obviously these are different categories, how to look at them, etc. But I would suggest that rather than an extension for my argument about the spiritual life of the Prophet, just at least don't be a minimalist and don't just reject something you don't know. Go out, think about it, look for examples. What do they mean? Do they tell us? Anything? And before that, think about this particular saying. What does it mean? Anybody, he who sees me, in fact, show me for the same, for Satan does not appear in my form. That's something very special. And, uh, and on this note, uh, I end it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your um, very scholarly, methodological and careful exposition of this subject with all the, the nuances and the different grades and the different um, facets of uh, this complicated, what, what seems, as you said, <coughs> at the beginning, it might seem to be a fairly clear cut, open and shut subject, but actually there are depths to it that are worth exploring. And I, I, I think a reasonable person would have to conclude, as you, you have, that the Quran does mention other miracles of the Prophet and um, other than his reception of the Quran, of course. Um, the numbers of those are disputed from pretty clear ones to probable ones and so on, uh, but there are a number of them. So the often repeated uh, Christian claim, perhaps, um, that there were no miracles even mentioned in the Quran is clearly false. Um, and you've given explanations as to why uh, they may hold this line uh, in the face of the evidence to the contrary. Um, which is curious, a curious state of affairs, shall we say. Um, but no, we'll, we'll leave it there, I think. Um, very interesting indeed. Thank you very much, Dr. Louis Fatui, for your time, expertise, and your, as I say, your careful exposition of this uh, whole subject, uh, which is uh, very interesting indeed. So thank you very much. Until next time. Thank you.